Welcome everybody. If you'd like to come in, come on in. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. Do I hear an adoption of the agenda? So moved. So second. Been, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please oh. say aye. Oh, wait, we got to no. do something. Pledge. Pledge. I know. I'll do it after this. Perfect. No, go ahead. Do oh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to propose an amendment to the agenda, please. I would like to move citizen comments to item number four in advance of presentations. And I'd like to move item number eight to uh, above item number seven in advance of ordinances and resolutions in consideration of staff. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and second for those changes in the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Passing unanimously. <laughs> On with that, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll lead us in that. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to close the button. Okay, we'll do citizens' comments real quick. Officers, thank you very much. So, yes, um, Nigel Kiefer. Welcome, Nigel. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm not too good at waxing eloquently and <laughs> extemporaneously and all that stuff, so I'm going to read my comments for you. My career spanned 45 years in local, city, state, and county government, during which time I have witnessed the gradual degradation of governance by weak, ethically challenged, morally bankrupt, stupid, godless, woke, academics and politicians. It is not a pretty picture. Remember the Peter principle? People in a hierarchy tend to rise to a level of respective incompetence. And here you are. But you are not alone. Just look at the city of Seattle and King County councils where arrogance is bliss. Remember the November 2, 2021 Proposition 1 levy for walkways, safe connections, parks, and recreation? I personally fought against this levy, which would have imposed a permanent perpetual property tax increase without a clear plan. Neighbors for a sustainable Lake Forest Park stated Prop 1 was a huge disappointment for citizens. The city pushed too hard, too fast, without a real plan for citizens to consider and without sufficient advance notice to allow citizen participation. The city's campaign by design was deceptive. And short duration bordering on malfeasance. The proposed special levy, election levy, failed and was noted as a major defeat for City Hall. In addition, the public schools embraced CRT, a woke Marxist ideology, and are indoctrinating children. Local governments, in collusion with the public schools, have embraced DEI, ESJ, BLM, anti-racism, LGBTQ+, transgender affirming, and equity ideology. When does this assault on our American values and virtues end? We have a new election in November. I hope the incumbents will recognize their level of respective incompetence has been attained and not seek another term. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. 
David Hepp. It's okay to leave this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is David Hepp, and I live at uh, 4748 Northeast 178 up on the Goat Trail. I have concerns about the roadway widths being proposed by Sound Transit through our community. On the 60% construction drawings, there is a significant discrepancy between the existing roadway sections at the ends of the Lake Forest Park segment and what is proposed for the section providing a new northbound bus lane. This design change profoundly affects our community, making the costs and impacts far higher than they could be. Figure one, and I think you all have a copy of these, shows the street view in front of Taco Bell, just this side of 145th. The existing roadway is approximately 75 feet curb to curb. This accommodates seven traffic lanes and a median divider. Figure two illustrates the current cross section as Botha Way approaches Ballinger. Here again, the roadway accommodates seven lanes of traffic with a median divider. Adjacent to Starbucks, the roadway measures 77 feet curb to curb. Similar roadway widths occur eastwards through Kenmore. No widenings proposed by Sound Transit in any of these areas, which already provide bat lanes in each direction. They are to be retained without changes to the current roadway cross section. The proposed roadway cross sections at issue are shown on 60% construction documents. Figure three illustrates the proposed roadway section in areas with seven traffic lanes and a median divider, the same functional cross section as those described above. This is proposed as an 87 foot curb to curb dimension. Figure four shows the proposed roadway section in areas with six through lanes, but no left turn lane. This is shown as a 76 foot curb to curb dimension. So here's the problem as I see it. In the existing no work areas, 75 to 77 feet provide for six traffic lanes in a left turn pocket. For much of the alignment downhill, including the areas showing the need for large retaining walls on the west side, the current proposal uses 76 feet to carry just six traffic lanes and a more extraordinary 87 feet where the left turn lane is needed. This bloat is due to a wider median and two foot shoulders between the traffic lanes and the curbs as shown on figure five. This is a significant change. The cost to taxpayers and the permanent environmental and visual burdens being placed on the city appear to be far greater than needed. In my view, it reflects a lack of critical thinking by the Sound Transit design team. Sound Transit chose not to follow existing design elsewhere in the Lake Forest Park Kenmore segments, but to use a design roughly 10 feet wider. Good design must consider the context and surrounding conditions. Good design strives to find a best fit. Local residents have tried to engage Sound Transit with concerns about the proposed design, but have had absolutely no response. I am concerned that Sound Transit considers citizen input irrelevant and plans to just ignore us. I urge the city's attention and involvement in the hopes that it can better pursue a productive response to what I see as a costly and short-sighted design choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Drew. Thank you. I'm uh, following up on David's presentation. And I just wanted to say something about the implications. And first of all, I'd like to thank the council for your diligence in pursuing the foot by foot uh, advocacy for the Sound Transit Project in Lake Forest Park. It's much appreciated. But just to say something about uh, the impact that just six feet of, of this uh, right away, moving that wall six feet could reduce the height of the wall by three feet. Uh, and six feet reduced width of the right of way could save approximately a half acre of property takings, a half acre of clearing and grubbing, a half acre of restoration. Six feet of reduced pavement section could save approximately 24,000 square feet of pavement and base and an 8% reduction in stormwater runoff volumes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vicki Scurry. Hi, and thank you. Um, thank you for attending our core meeting, those of you who attended, and thank you for writing letters, those of you who did. And I'm also going to follow up on David Hepp's um, presentation. And I'm going to just read a letter that I wrote today to the Sound Transit Board. 
And I also copied you, but I'm just going to read it. As a resident of Lake Forest Park, I am disappointed in the lack of transparency and effective communication between Child Transit and my community. 168 LFP, LFP residents signed a letter requesting Sound Transit to rethink the eastbound BRT lane at LFP using Q jumps to achieve a similar transit time savings of 2.3 minutes over a 1.2 mile stretch in our city, greatly lessening the impacts to residents and the environment. We have yet to read it, receive a response from Sound Transit or from the city. And that this does concern me because we went through a great effort and we really care and we know you care too. So we need to see some action. The most recent newsletter released this week does not begin to address community comments. This is from Sound Transit. It glosses over the impact of our residents' concerns with broad bush happy talk. I'm appalled by the lack of critical thinking or care that Sound Transit has extended to our community throughout the process. Recently, I learned that Sound Transit is planning to use a wider curb to curb footprint, six to nine foot wider than what is existing or planned for either Kenmore or Bothell without explanation. I'm including the letter by David Hepp, a landscape architect who lives in our community. Our concerns relate to the expansion of the road and how this impacts the following. One, removing more than 500 trees and even more shrubs along Bothell Way. Two, clearing and blading a 16 foot wide, 4,000 foot long swath along Bothell Way from 38th to Northeast 141st Street. And this is just a little of it. The most private property acquisitions of any segment along SD3 will be in LFP cutting and replacing the hillside with a series of tall monotonous concrete retaining walls nearly 4,000 feet in length, devoid of aesthetics, planting or noise mitigation and extending to the height of 16 feet. Increased noise reflected from the tall retaining walls and additional traffic volumes due to buses running every 10 minutes in both directions and an additional eastbound northbound traffic lane for vehicles. It's the rubber on the road that results in most highway noise and this is not addressed by sound transit. While I support transit, I support good design, critical thinking, and an open and transparent process. This process reflects little of this. The westward expansion was designed and implemented without informing residents on the west side of Bothell Way. Sound Transit worked extensively with the city of Lake Forest Park and residents on the east side of Bothell Way to create turnaround driveways, extending their driveways and creating a buffer between those homes by adding a six foot wide sidewalk and a four foot wide planting strip. Conveniently, the West Side residents were never contacted during this process. Our land, our trees, and our environment is expended to implement these design changes that benefit the wealthiest residents of Lake Forest Park most. In general, there is a great discrepancy between how the West Side of Bothell Way and the East Side of Bothell Way have been considered, both by the city and Sound Transit. This process is not equitable. From either a community perspective or a broader perspective, considering the impacts of S33 on Lake Forest Park compared to Kenmore and Bothell, and where fewer than half the property impacts occur primarily on commercial and retail properties, not residential. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, nobody else signed up. Anybody else out there would like to speak? Yes, come on up. Hi. Make sure to state your name, please. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Heather Skogerson, um, owner of Skog House Coffee right down in Lake Forest Park. Um, speaking on behalf of one of our customers who couldn't make it today, um, she was curious to know about more about the property that was purchased by the water and the plans that Lake Forest Park has for that property. Um, I've just heard little snippets from people talking about it, really haven't been able to get any greater information as to a time frame or what that would look like it sounds like it's supposed to be um lakefront access for people um, that don't have um beach access with the civic club um, um we're not really supposed to answer those questions but i'm going to answer it real oh, quick yeah, for you. you um the city purchased it to make it a public park so the city would finally have a park that all the citizens could use right that's great uh, as far as time timing we have a parks board that will start planning it um but it's going to be about five million dollars to build the park so I wouldn't see it happening very soon which is a shame but um that is I think it's one of the greatest things we've gotten in the city in a long time um we will hopefully our parks board member is on zoom with us Lori Bodie but that's just the quick answer we usually don't do that but that's real easy just to say we're working on it and we're very proud that we have that and Lori joined us on um zoom right there behind me and uh 
she's leading that. We do have money to actually starting the planning process. So that's a big part. And there will be a lot of public input for that. So please keep out for that because um, I think that's a big thing for the city. Great. I'll let her know. Thank you okay, for answering you that. Um, I think the broader question was, will there be space available for small businesses um, to have access to that space for, for the neighborhood? Oh, so I that have. was... I have no clue. No, and that's no, okay. Not one, not one <laughs> and thing. And I knew I wasn't going to get an answer. You know, she that's that was one of her thoughts as to where we could possibly be right. in a space that's a brick and mortar for the neighborhood, and so that's what she was asking about. Just keep an eye. You'll see. And mm -hmm. Councilmember Bodie will start her meetings pretty soon. And great, all everything's up in the air right now. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate you all bet. of you and what you do for the city. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Awesome. Anybody else at this time? Is there anybody on Zoom, Matt? If you want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. Doesn't look like it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll close citizens' comment and move on. Um, our first presentation tonight is from the Shoreline Fire Department. And uh, welcome, Chief. Thank you. I just lost my piece of paper. So introduce yourself and our guest on the... Sure, my name is Matt Cowan. I'm the fire chief at Shoreline Fire. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for <clears throat> inviting me to, to come here. Sorry, I'm fighting a little bit of a cough. So, um, and I wanted to applaud uh, many of the council members and I know council member uh, Casover especially, you know, was uh, very integral in some of the processes, the questions and and so forth in moving the North Shore Fire Department in joining the Shoreline Fire Department under a contract. So I applaud your asking good questions and being involved, you know, in, in that. And I know it was uh, it's fairly chaotic and dramatic at times, you know, over a couple of years. And so um, it's really exciting that we actually saw this across the finish line. And um, and I uh, will talk about a few different things, but it was it's been very seamless. So thank you for your involvement. Um, the it is a contract for services. Uh, it's not a full merger. I, I get that question quite a bit. Uh, it it uh, gives us a lot of efficiencies. It doesn't give us all the efficiencies of a merger, but it does allow for uh, some some more uh, control pieces in there. Um, the contract started on, on uh, June first of last year. Uh, I want also want to applaud the uh, our unions, uh, both the labor groups for the Legacy North Shore and Shoreline uh, unions. They they got together with me, and we very aggressively and proactively addressed all the, the issues that we could see. Now, granted, it wasn't all the issues that we've ended up having, but I was really happy to see how seamless it was and the fact that there was very little big issues, you know, that I was kind of expecting. A lot of little issues, but n really nothing, you know, all that significant. Um, the biggest issue I had to deal with, it, you can you may laugh, is is blending vacation hours of the of the personnel. <laughs> and I was like, if that's the biggest issue that I had to deal with, and you know, I felt that that was that was really actually pretty good. So um, it uh, and and again, that was that uh, it really was a lot of people, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of effort done by uh, the leadership in the unions and the support of the bodies, both the labor groups, um, the, the body of both the Legacy North Shore Fire Department and the Shoreline Fire Department, they all you know, work together on a daily basis. So this made a lot of sense. And at the end of the day, I think that that's what really helped with pushing this across the finish line too, is like regionalization is in front of us, all fire departments, at least, I don't know, you know, we, we, Mike and I were talking a little bit about police, you know, departments and so, so forth too, but it's in front of all of us. And the reason why is because if you do it with the right intention, transparency, motivation, timing, et cetera, a lot of it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And so I felt like this was all of those things, you know, coming to fruition. So a um, couple of things about uh, some of the improvements that we've been able to make. Not only were we able to reduce the equivalent levy rate and create, it was over a million dollars of savings. Uh, we also were able to improve levels of service. Um, the biggest one is probably um, the ability to deliver patients from the scene all the way to the hospital. It's a transport, a BLS transport program that, that I strongly believe in um, from a continuity of care uh, the relationship you build with the uh, the patient, and it's a faster transport to to the hospital. Um, and to do that, we actually added a uh, peak hour aid car right here, in, uh, right down the street here at Station 57, to make sure that we weren't taking that aid car 
uh, from Station 51, which is in Kenmore, out of service or out of district for too long to be able to do that transport. Um, we also had a lot of improvements in interoperability and efficiencies, strengthening relationships. You know, like I said, our personnel work together on a daily basis, but when you're in the same house or the same same organization, it just builds you know much stronger relationships, and we we immediately start seeing some of the efficiencies and improvements there. Um, and and actually, uh, our vice president uh, of the union, uh, Brian Ford, he can fill in some of the gaps too um, in a minute. But um, we were also able to uh, improve the numbers of uh, rescue personnel. Uh, you may know that we have a couple of jet skis now um, that uh, replaced jet skis. And we had uh, we were able to increase the numbers of uh, rescue personnel in, in both the legacy North Shore and Shoreline Fire Departments and be able to provide a higher level of service. The um, financially, like I mentioned, there was quite a bit of savings. The equivalent levy rate was that we were able to drop it in uh, 2023 to it's about 86 cents of equivalent levy rate, which is actually very low uh, for the type of department that that we are. Um, and that's a testimony also not only to the efficiencies. Now, AV did increase dramatically, but again, there was a lot of saving and we had significant increases in, in costs uh, coming into 2023, but we were able to, you know, uh, through those efficiencies, keep the um, the impacts to our citizens at a fairly, you know, equal, you know, level than that they'd uh, previously had, even with the huge increases in, in uh, cost of doing business. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, but anyway, um, we're also reinvesting some of those savings into improving the uh, capital side of our business. Uh, we are <laughs> still a couple years out, uh, but we're buying a new ladder truck, a couple of new aid cars, a new fire engine. And those will also help uh, over the over time, and both for Shoreline, Lake Forest Park, and Kenmore improve the levels of service uh, long term. So, um, with that, uh, I don't know. I probably took some of uh, uh, Brian's thunder, uh, but he also wanted to speak. Um, we uh, and it looks like uh, our union president is also on on uh, Zoom. Um, <laughs> Doug Lozier is our president, but Brian Ford was a legacy North Shore. An employee and uh, and is a vice president in our union, and uh, he also would like to to address the board or the council. Sorry, thank you. Welcome. Hello, this is Brian Ford. Um, yeah, and the chief did take most of my thunder. Um, so I picked <laughs> off most of the things I was going to say. Um, but first of all, I want to thank the uh, Lake Forest Park Council. It really couldn't have been done without the help from you guys um, with the whole prop prop one vote that we had. So, Julie. Um, we all thank you for all the help that uh, you gave us in that and the support. Um, really just to kind of echo, you know, it's been a super collaborative um, contract for service. You know, I call it a merger, but it's a contract for service. Um, we've really been able to increase the level of service. And, you know, with a, a larger department, we kind of have a larger think tank. So we've really been able to um, pull pull ideas and combine ideas, kind of throw out some old ones, bring in some new ones, which I think all in all is really allowing us to really bring a better better product. So I don't really have anything else uh, that the chief already didn't say. So if you guys have any questions or, you know, I could throw Doug under the bus and have him say something. Uh, <laughs> Sure, go ahead and throw them under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the prerogatives I have as a fire chief. I get to steal other people's thunder. So, <laughs> did you? I, I would be really curious to see if you had any questions for me, um, or any, you know, uh, anything that we're working on currently, or anything like that. Council. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mary Castover. Thank you so much, and and I had the privilege of of learning a lot more about fire services than I than I knew a couple of years back. So uh, during this whole process, so one of the benefits that I I could could see for the uh, allying with the shoreline fire department over some of the other suggestions was the um, the focus on the medic one and the good training that takes place, um, particularly when it comes to the um, emergency medical services. And so maybe could you just tell us how that's going and, and what sort of involvement you're now having from people who were part of North Shore in those programs? Sure. Um, there's actually probably two little aspects of, of that question. 
The first is on the medical side. Um, it, there is definitely, we have, let me back up and we have medic units, uh, three medic units across North King County, um, one in Shoreline, one in Lake Forest Park and one in, in Bothell. <clears throat> and prior to this contract, that, those were three different agencies. And, um, and the two other agencies at, th at that time utilize our personnel in different ways. They are firefighter paramedics. They are what we call combat rated so that they can go and fight fires and all that. But because they're not in the same organization, they're not, there isn't as much of that trust and that, you know, um, and that interoperability it depends on the shift in the station, you know, um, it's it, almost case by case basis. But that is one of the, the improvements too, is that having two of the medic units in this now in the same organization, there's more trust, there's more interop, you know, working together, there's more transfer of knowledge, you know, the, the medics being in the stations, you know, are being more actively involved in, in uh, training, you know, on a day to day basis with the suppression personnel. Um, just so there's improvements there. We also have moved our, um, our MSO to, to Kenmore, um, which adds a, a, another level of um, uh, ability to either manage a scene or to provide ALS care, uh, the paramedic level care. Uh, so there's been improvements there. And then the other piece that you, know, you touched on the training, and I was remiss a little bit in not talking about our, our consortium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have a, a North King County training consortium, which was, uh, it was four agencies at one point, uh, Shoreline, North Shore, Bothell, and Woodenville. Woodenville is now part of Eastside Fire, um, but we still remain with Bothell and now the bigger Shoreline Fire Department. And we train together. You know, we were training together before, but now it's even that much more improved, you know, as we, you know, get to know each other and, and the synergy of working together, you know, is definitely improved. Um, the medic program is, is something that if I'm sure you're probably mostly familiar with. It's a, we are a, a program under the King County EMS levy and as a subcontractor from the county deliver ALS services to all of North King County, all the way out through downtown Woodenville. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, Council Member Riddle. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Um, is on. Okay. I just wanted to know one, it's kind of a two-part question. One, sure. do you have a, a distinct and greater like 10-year vision now that you've seen what it, what bringing these two departments together offers you? And then sort of the second piece to that is the development of RACER and the, the crisis clinic. And how do you see that uh, impacting uh, the shoreline fire in uh, hopefully positive or, or other ways? Right. Um, I guess my vision is, and I've I've been this way for a long time. I, I am pro regionalization as long as it's done with what I was mentioning earlier, with the right timing, right reasons, and et cetera. So I would really like to see us still continue down that road uh, because it is the best way to get improved levels of service and efficiencies and and financial savings to either reinvest in those levels of service and or and it can be both uh, providing more savings you know and efficiency to the taxpayers so they um, not paying as much so I'd like to continue seeing you know some of that regionalization uh, efforts I know that Bothell is uh, considering it right now you know they're in the process of considering that um, I we have absolutely no idea where they'll end up they could still end up being you know reinvesting in in, in hiring a new fire chief and deputy chief and all that and and investing in their own uh, fire department, or they could look at regionalization, and maybe with us. I hope it is, you know. Um, but it could be with another agency as well. So I think that's in front of us, you know, all fire departments. Uh, and you see it. We're actually in King County. We're a little, <laughs> we're a little behind the game compared to other counties and states, and so forth. And so I think that that's from a from a vision standpoint. I'd like us to continue, you know, working on that. Um, I'd actually like it would be nice to actually have a merger you know, uh, at some point with with uh, the, the legacy North Shore Fire Department, because there is still a little bit more efficiencies there that can be gained, but that can be, you know, that, that doesn't have to happen anytime really soon or anything like that, but there are some efficiencies there. It'll be interesting also to see what happens with uh, the medic, you know, you were asking about the medic program to see if there's, you know, regionalization that can occur there too. Um, but for me, um, I probably have about another five years or so. I'd really like to see us, you know, have a, a consolidated North End, you know, fire department. That would be really, uh, that'd be really cool for, for I think, for all the citizens as well. So 
Um, as far as the crisis clinic, uh, I did get a, a chance to meet with the uh, connections. <clears throat> um, and it was a really great, it was the first time I had met with them. And it was really great to see what their vision is and their track record and their, their success that they've had um, in Texas and Arizona. Um, and uh, so I'm excited to see what they can do with the new facility um, over by um, Evergreen. And, uh, and it's coming online sometime, I don't know the exact, sometime next year, I think. Um, I'm hoping that it will uh, be able to be an asset for everybody in the region geographically. I think here we're, we're fine, but I'm, I'm, you know, for the shoreline uh, uh, people that would need that help, it's a little bit further to go. It'll be interesting to see also how many, I think it's gonna get utilized a lot. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how they can flex with the, um, the influx of people that are, that are being either walking in or being transported there and so forth. It is definitely a gap in the services that has been needed for a long time. I feel like the dinosaurs roamed the earth, but uh, you know, when I was on, this, on the street, when I was actually delivering services, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, and so um, we give them a card, you know, call this this office, the social services office, knowing that, you know, the, the chances of getting the right people to get the help was a, such a long shot. And we've come so far with that. We have, uh, as you probably know, we have an MIH program, a mo mobile integrated health care program um, that serves, again, the uh, all the way out to uh, to Woodenville. Uh, and that helps with the, the uh, um the people that are needing some of those social services, it's kind of bridging some of the gap to this uh, crisis clinic. Um, and they are go out and proactively work with people, you know, pairing them up with the services they need or helping them get, you know, whatever they need. Um, and it's the low acuity calls. So it's, it also takes away from somebody calling 911 or even going to a hospital to, a, to an emergency room or something like that. And so I see this all working kind of together. Um, and I know that there's a focus in the county of actually, you know, uh, expanding the number of crisis care, you know, clinics or, or, or facilities. So, um, so I'm really excited to see where it goes. Can't come soon enough. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, it is a, a big draw on our services. And when you draw those services, that means that that, that apparatus and those, that staff is not in service for a, a potentially more serious uh, uh, call. So that's something that we always keep track of. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member? Yes, council member Goldman. Um, yeah, um, also thank you for your presentation. And I wanna commend you and your entire team for how um, seemingly seamlessly you've integrated both North Shore and Shoreline Fire Departments together. Uh, I know things were quite tense in the community around the uh, Prop 1 vote. So I'm glad that things have been integrated smoothly. Um, I wanted to ask you about level of service. So mm -hmm. uh, I was hoping you might comment um, on time, uh, call times and, and this was like the time it takes from when someone makes an emergency call to when fire or ambulance arrives. And has that changed much since the, uh, the contract? Uh, that, that's a good question. And unfortunately I can't, I don't have, you know, data to back it up. We are in the process or we've been switching over uh, with our CAD systems from the dispatch. And so uh, some of the data is not as accurate and, has not been cleaned enough to be able to track uh, like a before and after. At least anecdotally, I would say that we're probably even doing better than what we were before. Uh, and I say that because of adding a, a peak hour aid car, the improved staffing levels that we've had across our entire system, that all helps to contribute to, you know, a better performance out on the street, which is why we're here, is to serve the public. I mean, you know, and so anything that interferes with us delivering high levels of service, we, we take very seriously. And so we try to, you know, to um, maximize that, that service. So I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had data that I could back it up. Uh, it's just my, my gut feel that, that we're doing it as good or better. Um, but at some point, we will have data that I will be able to come back and, and say, okay, this is what our response time was before. This is what our response time is now, you know, and, and the reliability of rigs uh, in the, in the uh, fire stations themselves. Uh, we are in the process right now of evaluating um, Station 54, which is in South Kenmore. Uh, it's across the SLU and trying to evaluate whether or not we want to keep that as a potential, you know, long-term uh, fire station at some point, and whether or not the growth will ever dictate a need for us to be staffing a, a, a station over there. Um, I should have that report out in the next couple of months, 
it's a, uh, we're using a forecasting model software and a forecasting model to look at what the next 30, 40, 50 years looks like with population growth zoning, you know, and so forth. And a lot of that will come back to those reliability and response time statistics that, that you were asking about to see what that looks like, you know, um, so that we can make sure that we're getting in front of where the population and the growth is, you know, and not decreasing the level of service. That's yes. good to hear. Thank you. Hey, I, I wish I had better. I wish I had the data. Sorry, Bob. Okay, not seeing anybody else. Um, we have. I have a policy, Lieutenant Lozier. If you're on my screen, you at least got to say hello. Okay. <laughs> well, how you doing a, tonight? That looks like he's on duty too. So yeah, I was thinking you're the only one working here. So how's it going over there? Oh, it's going very well. You know, I, I figured you guys would be a little bit more interested in hearing about things from uh, Vice President Ford's opinion, just because he is from a, a legacy North Shore Fire Department. So feel like uh, being Lake Forest Park, you might be a little bit more interested to hear what he had to say. So, but thank you very much for having us on. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you guys very much. Thanks to the whole crew. Um, it's been really job, exciting. It really has. Sure. But the part of our job as the mayor and council is our citizens to go to bed feeling safe and secure at night. And because of you and the people standing behind you, I don't know who's on the street tonight, but they're all behind you. But... Well, Doug, Doug, Doug's, Doug's on the street. I, well, I know he is. Funny. But if you look behind you, we're, yeah. we're, we have a lot of few of our people here. So thank you very much. We look yeah, forward and, to uh, anytime that you guys want uh, it, uh, data or a report out or whatever, please, you know, don't hesitate to, to get a hold of me. No problem. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chief. Good night. Okay. With that, we're going to do the rest of the meeting and then talk to the police. I was just <laughs> um, At this time, I'd like to introduce Chief Harden, uh, chief of one of the finest and safest police departments in the state of Washington, I like to say. Chief, it's all yours. And thank I you. Wanna, uh, I wanted to stop real quick and just thank the Shoreline Fire Department. They have been an outstanding um, partner with us for many years with North Shore Fire. They've been great. And then Shoreline Fire just picked up right where they left off of just great compliments. We even had one of their firemen write up a, um, a letter of accommodation for Officer um, Brandon Carlsruhe, which we'll talk about later. And um, they've been a great partner. The medic situation has been great because we were able to not only use the uh, AMR units, but the medic units to get folks off the road quicker into the hospital. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you for your partnership. It's been fantastic. We can't wait thank to you. everything going forward. It's been a great partnership. Thank you. All right, give me a second. We had some technical difficulties with uh, some of this stuff and hopefully we're able to make this work. All right. All right. So is that feedback me or? I think so. So let's see if there's a, because uh, I got it muted, but and everything's shut down. So we'll see if this works. So tonight I'm going to present the 22 annual report to council. So we're going to talk about what happened last year. Um, in order for me to do this job, I have to have an amazing staff. Quite a few of us are here tonight, which is really cool to see. We have the crew that's working the night shift. We have a couple officers that we're going to put on spotlight tonight. But I wanted to just recognize my two lieutenants here, um, the commanders of our uh, divisions for patrol operations and support services. Um, I look at myself as a servant leader. I'm at the bottom and I'm just trying to hold up my lieutenants. They hold up all of the sergeants and the support staff. And then it's the officers that are at the top. They're the ones that do the great work out here and the hard work, the tough work, the stuff that... Um, you got to see all the trauma all day long. You got to hear the, the negative comments all day long, but they're here basically to serve the people and to help the people. And they do a tremendous job at this and it is a tough job as you all know over the years. So starting with our mission, it's been this way for quite a while. Um, our mission is to develop a, and support a team of professionals who consistently seek and find innovative policing strategies to affirmatively promote, preserve and deliver those quality services, which enhance the security and safety in our community. To support this mission, we work in strong partnership with the community. We also have our value statement, which is our department values the sanctity of all life. We strive for the equal, equitable, and compassionate application of law enforcement services for all 
and the universal acceptance of all people. We endeavor for the highest level of training and diversity for our police staff and maintain partnerships within our community and local governments to provide urgently needed resources for those in need. This is really that guiding document um, for our police department. So tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our staff and then we're gonna have our division commanders, uh, Lieutenant Lehman and Lieutenant Zanilla go through um, much more of the meteor portion of our uh, presentation. We'll talk briefly about radar, a little bit about community uh, outreach, and then a little bit of the future. And I wanna point out that bottom part, continually building trust within the community with excellence and customer service. I think our customer service is the best by far in this entire region, if not the state. I think our officers deliver amazing customer service and it has shown over and over again, it, it's incredible. So this is our PD's organizational chart. It's split up in two different areas in the police department where you have our operations, which is our sergeants and our officers. And then we have our support services, which is everything else. Um, Lieutenant Zanilla has the administration, the court, the uh, not the court, but the uh, court proceedings that happen with law enforcement, um, transports, records, uh, property, all of the fun, um, exciting administrative stuff. And then, and the detectives investigations. And then our operations is with our sergeants. You'll see that our sergeants have four different crews, four different sergeants with three officers on each crew, except for one uh, particular crew, which I, I would love to have one day to fill that spot. You'll notice in red, those are officers that left uh, or folks that left in 2022. So you'll see officer Fairholm um, left in the middle of 22. And then we were working on trying to get that position filled. Now I'll go into that in a second, the next slide with her. We also have Detective Troxel that was investigations. She was with us for 15 years and she moved on to another department, had a great opportunity, but it's heartbreaking to see her leave. And then we had uh, Jenny Grogan was our longtime DV advocate. She worked here over 20 years. She was in the field for 40 years um, and she retired and moved on. And we have a new person in that spot. And then Officer Brecht is on that list, but he left in 23. So, it was, uh, so we do have those three open positions for officers right now. So going into the retirements and separations that happened in 22, we have our record specialist, Lee Freeman, worked over 30 years in the city, was a dispatcher when we had our own dispatch um, for the city. We weren't uh, partnered with Bothell. And um, everything that I'm gonna talk about, I got the 22 annual report to all of council. Um, that has been published online, so the public can do uh, pull that up. Some of these stories for these folks are in there, so I'm not going to go over them tonight, but you can definitely read about these folks. Um, but like I said, DV advocate Jenny Grogan had retired, and then uh, Officer Fairholm battled a long, uh, battle, long battle with breast cancer, fought it, won it, and decided that she was going to get out of law enforcement at this point in time and go spend time with family out in Oklahoma. So she has uh, moved on and then um, Detective Troxel that I talked about earlier, which is really heartbreaking to me personally. Um, I was her boss for about seven, eight years directly and she's just a fantastic employee. I know all the guys miss her a lot. Um, so I just wanted to put her on a little spotlight. Mm -hmm. Then we had new hires in 22. Kelsey um, Altis is one of our record specialists that um, took over the position from Lee Freeman. We also have Kelly Vetters that came in 21 and I have an amazing records crew. They are fantastic. And Kelsey picked it up like so quick and she has been phenomenal. So I've got the best records people in this state. <laughs> um, they are fantastic. Officer Scott Benjamin started uh, the beginning of the year from a a uh, retirement we had in 21, came from uh, Duval. He is now our fleet manager and is just picking up projects left and right and has been doing a fantastic job. We also hired a uh, chaplain, um, not hired, but he's volunteer uh, from Frank uh, Barisel, the chaplain that we used to have. So we filled um, uh, that position with Andy. We also have a new chaplain that came in this year, but we're just talking about 22 here. <laughs> and as you all know, with our NEMCO emergency manager, Kevin Lowry came in the middle of the year, May time period. So he's hitting a, his one year mark pretty soon. So we brought him on board in 22. Um, and he just happens to be in the police department's uh, budget and uh, as our full-time employees. So I'm going to be sort of hypocritical in this particular slide. So safety in Lake Forest Park. I want to make sure that you all know that this city is very safe and relative to everything that's around us, it is amazing because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in all the cities around us 
and it's amazingly safe. Our numbers are low and they have been historically, they continue to be historically. And in this particular slide, you will see that we were honored with having in 22, all of 22, the safest place in the state of Washington ranking second. We were also recognized with the SafeWise Safest City that was just published in March as the fourth in the entire state city. That's something to be very proud of. There's a lot of metrics that they use to get these uh, you know, levels of where folks are gonna be. And we've been consistent in this particular um, award for many years and it's been great to see that. That shows our safety in our community. Now the hypocritical part is gonna come up that we're not perfect and there is crime. We have big city problems in a small city and there is no question you've seen in our city administrative reports, I've been adding as much information as I possibly can so that you understand what's going on in your city. Um, we are not unique in all the different crimes that happen in Seattle, they happen here. And you've seen that on the news um, in our social media and all of our newsletters. So I want you to understand as we go through and, and uh, the lieutenants go through investigations and operations and all this kind of stuff that shows numbers, overwhelmingly we're doing awesome and we will continue to. And it's because of this, this staff, it's just amazing. So now I'm gonna introduce Lieutenant uh, Rhonda Lehman, our division commander for operations. This one? Okay. All right. I'm Lieutenant Rhonda Lehman. I've been here 29 years now and a lieutenant for just over three years. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the police law updates. Here we have a list of all the key bills we went over with all of you in 2021. Um, in 22, several of these laws underwent updates to address consequences resulting uh, from their 21 version. We had to train and retrain the officers each time these laws changed. The enactment of these laws resulted in over 60 incidents where drivers refused to comply with officers' attempts to stop them for a variety of violations or reasonable suspicion of involvement in criminal activity. Consequently, the city has experienced an uptick in vehicle damage and pursuits of suspects often result to ramming patrol vehicles to escape. That's not unique to Lake Forest Park. That's just the 60 over 60 incidents within our city since these laws were enacted and the amount of damage we've suffered because of that. Um, as of 23, they're still being reviewed um, to strike a balance between reform, law enforcement, and community safety. Um, next, I'm going to show some videos that give you a quick glimpse into what our officers are having to deal with almost daily here in Lake Forest Park. So this is going to be what we consider a regular traffic stop. Should I do that? Just, just, you can do that. I did. <laughs> Eastbound 17200 block, both. Uh, Lincoln 8, driver just took off from me eastbound. I am not in pursuit. Me over. Officer Walker almost run over the fence. Another view of the same call. Get out of the car! Don't do
behind the wheel in front of Great Harbor. I got all this paraphernalia right here. Hey there. Hey, boss. Police department. Hey, how you doing? Hey. I'm Officer Coleman, Lake Forest Park. Just so you know, everything's out of your video recorded. Just say, oh. hey, don't, don't back up. My Do, car is right behind Do it. not back up, my man. Do not drive back. Hey, I'm nope. Stop. Okay. Stop. 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 Hey. Stop. Pull him out. Frank, out. Go ahead and close the air. I apologize for the uh, video choppy because we're running off of uh, this machine and it's online. We normally would have a clear, but I want you to just understand the point on these three different occasions that the officers are just trying to do their job. And now there's this air of lawlessness of I can do anything I want. And this is showing what those effects are. And in these cases, these officers are now, because of the particular laws that are in effect, have to let this go. And I have to tell you, being in in law enforcement, as long as I have, that tears at our heart because we're the ones that are supposed to jump in there and take care of our public. And we and to see us just say bye is ridiculous. I, I don't really, I'm not very vocal on this kind of stuff and get as emotional um, because I try to keep it as neutral, but this really, really irritates me that, that we're in this situation. But we have such professional people out here that do such an amazing job. And I want you to all understand that that's what your police department does. Next. Okay, so next I have a patrol story for you. On February 8th in uh, 2022 at approximately 11 p.m., officers Carlswood and Benson responded to an unknown situation where callers reported hearing gunshots and people yelling. While in route, a third caller reported he'd been shot in the abdomen by a neighbor or a squatter. The victim told dispatch he did not know where the subject was who had shot him. The officers arrived within minutes to an extremely chaotic scene with family members frantically screaming for help. Officer Carls relocated a male subject with a gunshot wound and immediately started life-saving measures using his tactical trauma kit. Officer Benson provided cover in case the suspect returned. Additional officers from Bothell and King County arrived shortly to assist. Aid personnel refused to come to the active scene for their safety. They stayed several blocks away. Officers then utilized a patrol vehicle to evacuate the victim, driving him to the waiting medic unit for advanced medical care and transport. During this investigation, officers dealt with extremely hostile and uncooperative witnesses and family members. Multiple attempts to locate or identify the suspect were unsuccessful. Officers entered this active scene with no thought for their safety. They were only there to help this person who had been shot and to apprehend the suspect. Medical responders later contacted the police department stating Officer Carlswood's actions that night likely assisted in the victim's survival. And I just wanna say that's not the incident the chief mentioned earlier. That one was in 2023. We'll talk about that one later, but now I'm gonna turn this over to Chief Hardin um, and I'll bring up your best man, Come on up here, gentlemen. So we're gonna break for a real quick second here and we're going to uh, recognize a life-saving award for these gentlemen. So. This certificate of life-saving award is awarded to Officer Brandon Carlsrud and Officer Jason Benson. In recognition of their bravery and quick thinking and life-threatening situation, Officers Carlsrud and Benson demonstrated remarkable courage and took decisive action to save the life of another human being. Their selflessness and dedication to preserving life in the danger of true is a true testament to the highest values of humanity. Their actions have inspired us all and serve as an example of the impact that our officers have in serving our community. We, the City of Lake Forest Park and the Police Department are proud to honor Officer Brandon Carlsrud and Officer Jason Benson with this life-saving award as a symbol of our gratitude and admiration for their heroic actions presented on this 13th day of April, 2023. I will say that they are very embarrassed. They don't want to do this. Um, our, na our nature is not doing this. They'd rather actually be doing what they just did here right now, as opposed to being recognized for this. I know that for a fact. Um, we also have these pins. These are life-saving award pins that we will, uh, they are able to put on their uniforms. Um, you will see our military and fire and that police. We have these pins that we get. So this is a life-saving award. So, thank you, gentlemen. I don't know if there's a picture. Can I get in front of the counselor here? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
You know, gentlemen, I'm so proud of you that I'm not going to make you give us a speech. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I got it. Okay, so now we're going to go back to our presentation. So these are the numbers for the police responses in 2022. We had over 9,600 incidents involving uh, our officers responding. Our five-year average is just over um, 10,400. It looks like we're staying low after COVID. You can see where they dropped off. But these numbers are staying low because we have less staff. We have to spend more time training. And we're not able to go out and do all the proactive things that we like to do. So the numbers uh, would be higher because officers will go out and do more stuff and answer more citizen um, requests for service. And the numbers will get higher. But that's why they're staying low. And we're having to deal with a lot more intensive crimes. It, it takes a long time to write these reports. So they're spending a lot of time off the road dealing with all these extra crimes. Okay. All right. So here's an overview of police activity. I just want to point out that we're trending upwards a little bit back to pre-COVID numbers. And if I can just point out the drug arrests, you can see post the Blake decision where they dropped from, we went from 80, 58, 47 in 2020, which was COVID, uh, all the way down to 14 and 12. And they're going to continue to trend down um, until these fixes come in with the uh, new Blake law decision uh, adjustments. Okay. Property crimes, I just really want to point out that motor vehicle theft is trending upward and uh, theft. Burglaries are down. They've, they've been consistently trending downward. We're doing really good on keeping uh, that in a downward trajectory, but thefts are basically skyrocketing and it's mostly um, shoplifts from the mall. We're having just almost daily, if not one, two, three, or four. It's all day long. Okay, so collisions, collisions are good. They're not going back up to pre-COVID levels. They're staying low. The majority of them are on Bothell and Ballinger and they're typically low speed, distracted driving, rear end type things. Um, so without Bothell and Ballinger, we would have a very low number of collisions. We're doing really well there. Okay. Our red light and school zone cameras. So if you look at 2020 there, obviously COVID shut down the schools. In 2019, we put in some new technology, which is why we have the higher numbers now. Obviously when school went back into session, we had an explosion when people were not um, used to having to drive through the school zones again once the schools opened up. We all know how that went. Uh, now in 2022, we've leveled off and we believe that these numbers will stay consistent as they are now uh, going forward. And now I want to introduce the best partner I could ever ask for, <laughs> Lieutenant Zanella. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. You know me, Lieutenant Diego Zanella. Uh, basically, I oversee everything that is boring in our department. So everything like evidence, <laughs> like uh, records, uh, accreditation, stuff like that. So, but I'm lucky because I also supervise the detectives. And so that's a pretty cool thing too. To have. So let's see the um, incoming cases, which are basically the cases that were assigned to our detectives in 2022. Um, you can see that we have more cases than 2021, but way less than uh, 18, 19, and 20. And um, there are a couple of numbers that I would like to point out. First of all, uh, drug cases. Basically, drug cases uh, are no longer there because detectives in our department uh, investigate felony cases or cases where minors are involved. So that's, we went from uh, 23 in uh, 18, 2018 to two in 2022. Um, another couple of strange numbers are number the, ass the assaults and we'll see also the uh, sexual assault and assaults. Uh, they went up, uh, but it's not just for our cities in the Puget Sound area. The, all these numbers are going up and the state. Uh, the state is seeing uh, a lot of uh, uh, sexual assault and assaults in, in general. 
the next uh, slide is, I think it's pretty interesting. If you take the, the drug cases and the backgrounds of the chart, basically you can see that 53%, 53, 54% of the cases assigned to our detectives are property crimes and 35% are um, crimes against people. And it's, that's pretty typical for our region. Uh, next slide, it's uh, the completed investigation. So the investigation that went somewhere in our department. And I'm pretty proud of this slide because um, basically um, we, our detectives closed a lot of cases. So either way, actually the next slide will show something better. Either way, we don't have enough evidence. And so we can't do it too much. If you don't have evidence, you don't have evidence. But if evidence is enough, our detectives either way arrest the person, the, the suspect, or they file charges in King County, in Snohomish County, or they go back to district court or, or, or uh, local court. So almost 60% of our cases are closed by our detectives, which is huge, huge. Um, the investigation story that I would like to talk to you is to show how complicated sometimes our cases are. We are a small town, so we think that there is not very much you know, going on, but well, actually there is a lot going on. And this is a very interesting case to me. So last year in, in July, early in the morning, uh, both of dispatch advised our officers that there was a shooting, a drive-by shooting, and uh, somebody was bleeding outside an apartment complex. So our officer responded immediately. Also, both PD responded immediately. And uh, when they arrived, um, of course, they saw that somebody was outside bleeding with a towel, trying to uh, keep the, the, the bleeding from expanding. And um, so our officer immediately did the right, did the right thing. So uh, Sergeant Parrish actually was the first one to go toward the uh, victim. He saw that he was bleeding. He took his tourniquet, put the tourniquet right away, stopped the bleeding. And they started to make sure that everybody, everybody else was safe, the scene was safe, and uh, they started the what we call preliminary investigation. So that's what our officer, our patrol officer found when they arrived. And so at that point, we start to talk to people. And uh, so the victim who is bleeding tells us that he doesn't know how, but somebody from the roadway shot him and he went to the first apartment he found, he knocked on the door and he said, somebody shot me, help me. So the person, the witness who was inside the apartment said, uh, okay, don't come in my apartment, I don't know you, but I will give you a towel to stop bleeding, to help stop the bleeding. So those are the, you know, some of the things that the preliminary investigation started to understand. So uh, both, witness and victim say, I don't know the other person. It was just a coincidence. I was here and I went to the first apartment. Uh, the witness was intoxicated, but it doesn't matter. She did the right thing. She gave a towel to somebody who was bleeding. So, okay. She was a little conf confrontational with, with us, but a lot of people don't like the police. So that's fine. We understand that. Unfortunately, the mother of the witness arrived immediately, almost immediately. Uh, I know that for a fact because I was there when she arrived and she was immediately um, confrontational with us, uh, telling the, the daughter, don't talk, uh, they don't need to know anything. So it was a little bit strange, but you know, some, like once again, some people don't like the police, they don't want to talk to us, totally understand, but we are not gonna force anybody, especially a witness, right? So now you, you have a little bit of a, an idea what we were going through at that time. Let's see what really happens. So we check the videos that other people, other houses have around as your residents and now there's no shooting from the, the, the street. Nobody from the roadway shot toward this guy. So this is the first kind of strange uh, first thing. And uh, somebody, well, two or three people from the resident, from the apartment complex are like, no, there was one shot inside the apartment of the witness. So now we change, right? The scenario is completely different from when Sergeant uh, Parrish arrived and put the, the tourniquet. 
So we are like, okay, we need to write a search warrant and check the witness apartments. So that's what we did. The, uh, we needed to have uh, legal consent. So we went inside the apartment and now we find some blood inside the apartment. Once again, something changed now. And we also find a bullet hole inside the apartment. So now the shooting was inside the apartment, not outside. It was not a drive-by shooting. And uh, we found also a spent shell casing hidden in a trash can. So can you see how different the two scenarios are and how our detectives need to really work hard to ascertain what really happened from when they started and responded. So um, the witness at the end um, said, yeah, I know the victim, but I don't want to talk to you guys. And uh, so basically it's where we are right now. The investigation is still in progress. So basically my point is that we, are, we have really, really good detectives because eventually they were able to understand what was going on, but it wasn't like that when they showed up at the scene. And so I'm really proud to be in charge of them because you know, the level of professionalism and you know, they, they really thought, okay, we need to, what, to do one step at a time, put the puzzle together and see what really happened. So, Yes, we are a small town, like the chief said, but sometimes we have these very complicated cases and we want to solve the cases like we were in Seattle or we were working for King County Sheriff's Office. So that's the level of professionalism that uh, we have in our department. So I think time for it. You've heard about the shooting that, um, that Brandon and uh, Jason were involved with. You've heard of the shooting that we had the other day with uh, the, the burglary incident. We had an incident at Sheridan Heights not too long ago where somebody had fired their weapon. You, there's this one. So it's kind of like, oh my goodness, what is going on? These are the things that we're dealing with. Um, he kept saying our detectives and that just breaks my heart because Amy was part of this when he says they, because right now we only have one detective that has 60 cases that he has worked on top of the backgrounds that he's trying to complete to get folks hired. So I just wanted to put that in your um, mind. So I thank you very much, lieutenants. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about North Sound Radar because I know that the council knows what radar is all about. And radar was the entity that we were using in 2022. So during 2022, radar navigators served a total of 568 individuals during 1,548 encounters. And that's all of the agencies that are involved which we all know, but I'll say it just for the community's um, view, is Shoreline, Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, Kenmore, Bothell, and Kirkland. So during 2022, mental health professionals, uh, navigators met with 22 individuals in Lake Forest Park, some multiple times during a total of 88 encounters. And the average length of encounter was 31 minutes. Um, and I just want to stress that we've had two navigators on a frequent basis last year. They were fantastic. They do lighten the load for the officers. And I am so excited to see how this racer program is going to work and how the uh, trauma center um, and connections is all going to fit into these nice big pieces. So next time that I come back here and I present 23's report, I think we'll be excited to say we're really close or we just opened up and we're excited to see how that's going to happen. So through everything that we've been doing, we still continue. Um, I've been doing this presentation here for 10 years. This is my 10th year doing it, their fourth year doing this. Um, and one thing that has stuck is um, uh, um, Council Member Cassover, when one of the years said she was so impressed with just doing our normal job and how much we've communicated or uh, had that connection with community. And we still provided that. We still did shop with a cop, did summer safety day, polar plunge, national night out, torch run for special Olympics, department visitors coming in doing tours and just kids want to check stuff out, our blood donation drives and events that we've done. And when I look back over the years of, uh, you know, pictures and things that we've kept track of, it is amazing that we're able to still pull this off somehow, and especially with how short staffed and the, the amount of weight that we all have on our plate. Um, but this part is so important for our community. And so it's just something, a testament of um, 
how, how awesome it is to do this. And shop with a cop. I mean, uh, Diego puts on and uh, coordinates that whole event. It is a lot of work and top of trying to run everything else. We brought uh, the bike rodeo in 21, which is a smaller event up at Lake Forest Park Elementary, giving some bike helmets away and teaching some kids how to uh, ride their bikes and obey signs. That expanded to our summer safety day where we had um, expanded quite a bit and we're going to do it again this year and it'll be I think July yeah, July we'll be doing that again um, we also have an axon road show where all the technology we have with our tasers um, they have drones they have their um, uh, 3d equipment that used for training um, when you do scenario based things they've got all kinds of software they're just an amazing company right now they're taking over like Motorola did they're going to come out and do a road show in May where they're going to come out here and show the public this is the technology that we're using. So um, there's a lot of different events that we're, we're working on and hopefully we can get through. So I just wanted to show that community connection. I also wanted to spend a little bit of time on the North Sound Police Foundation. Um, the North Sound Police Foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports law enforcement agencies in Lake Forest Park and Mill Creek. The foundation's mission is to enhance public safety and build community partnerships by providing resources and support to law enforcement agencies. So when Officer Shoup was um, killed in the line of duty in Bothell, it did not look like Bothell was set up for a mechanism for all the support and donations that were going to come in. And so they, they looked like they were scrambling a little bit of how they're going to handle that. And I thought, what happens if that were to happen here? We're not prepared. So I reached out to the North Sound Police or the Mill Creek Police Foundation and tried to see if we can create a template. So I wanted to gather some citizens for Lake Forest Park and develop some kind of foundation. Ended up working out really well that we mold, put basically um, what our ideas for Lake Forest Park with Mill Creek and created this uh, police foundation. We have gotten so many nice, uh, amazing donations from folks in the community, some way too generous, I think, but it, I'm going to take advantage <laughs> of it. Um, and you've seen in previous councils where we've talked about grants and how we have gotten some things, um, and it has been amazing. They've provided over $34,000 for eyes and ears for training, a storage trailer because we're busting out of the seams in this particular building, trying to create a gym, so we were moving items out of that room. Pepperball equipment where you had Brandon and Jason here one day showing you what that equipment was about. Um, we're doing a health and wellness day in June where we're bringing in some folks to talk about trauma, bringing their spouses, having a, a really nice dinner at the same time of this training. And we're outfitting a gym. Uh, we got a grant through WASPIC to get some gym equipment. Um, we have not ever had a gym. Uh, I don't think ever, even Windermere, there was nothing. So now we'll have at some point when it's built out um, a place where they can work out and exercise and yoga, whatever they want to do that. Uh, just trying to provide that health and wellness and then radio communication equipment. PCERN is going to be coming into play someday. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and then uh, I know that uh, Sergeant Adams has been uh, really pushing about doing a UAV, a drone and using that equipment. And so he's going to be presenting for any questions you have, because I know there's questions about U UAVs and security. And I want everybody to understand what it's all about, because virtually everybody around us is getting this, U these, uh, this equipment. So I want to, you know, obviously take on every kind of resource I possibly can to, to give these guys. So um, and then gym equipment, like I mentioned. So now where are we going in the future? Clearly staffing is our number one uh, problem. I want to continue support for retention. That's our most important goal. So I want the council to know that. And you've already talked quite a bit about that. And I know the support is there from every one of you. We need to keep the, pot, the people that we have because they have such an institutional knowledge and training. Uh, and it is important to keep that because starting over, it's a whole other story. And it's also finding the best people we can to serve our community. We are having a difficult time finding people that first of all, want to do this job. It's, it's not very attractive. Uh, so you have to have some very special people and then trying to find that diversity and finding people that are all about our community and what they understand. Um, but we also have to have that customer service aspect and they need to have that culture uh, built into them that they wanna help people. So we are looking and doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Zanella has been heading that up of trying to recruit and do the best uh, of pulling folks in and we're, we're close. I don't want to spoil too much right now because I like knock on wood, we have two that very close to being hired. And then one more that just popped into our uh, radar that out of nowhere. So um, hopefully this, this person 
um, passes. So we hopefully can get these positions filled, but it has been a very difficult road. Second is health and wellness. I really wanted to start this in 2018 when Chief Sutton was here and I, I came back from the National Academy and said, this is something that we have to focus on. It is difficult to do because of budgets. And also there's a culture of people not wanting help. You know, I want to send every officer to the psychologist every year and say, just talk, just talk to the people. You don't even have to say too much, but just be there. But they don't want to. They're, they're, that's not their, the way they are, but we're trying to break some of these walls down to find ways to, to focus on that health and wellness. And so we're gonna focus on training, getting any kind of equipment that is in that world and trying to create that ease of access to wellness resources and creating that culture. And these two will be doing our ABLE training coming up, which is that duty to intervene, uh, but it has a health and wellness component to it. It's about, you know, you see an officer, whether they're doing some kind of use of force that they shouldn't be because that day they're out of their mind and you're able to recognize, hey, stop what you're doing and you're gonna save them, they save their career, but also, they're going through family issues and you see that they're just down all day long what's going on there so it's a it's a package that they're going to go through and teach in culture and i know we've been doing it over the years but now it's just a little bit more formalized third is technology um i am a techie guy i like all the the stuff that we can do with software and equipment i think it pro provides efficiency so we're going to keep going down those roads of anything that can just deliver a better um, package for our city for costs for efficiency and getting people to getting officers to get their job done much quicker and get out on the road and do the work they need to do uh, I have a question mark there on PCERN. It's been going on since 2016. <laughs> that is seven years, I believe, at this point. Um, but we actually have the flashlight on right now where I can see that light. I attended the King County Chiefs meeting today. PCERN did their uh, presentation of where we are. And we actually are really close in the next, next couple of months. Seattle's pretty much done uh, with their delivery of equipment. So now they're going to spread down to south of I-90. And then we're in the next wave after that. So I anticipate, I hope in May, uh, well, it's supposed to be late April, we're in April, May, that we get our portable radios, what we've desperately needed. And when I first got cheap, I'm like, Mayor, we got to do something with the radios because it's been, it's just terrible, the equipment. And we are just holding on right now. So hopefully in May, we get these radios. And then um, I think it's around July, August, the mobile units will be installed. Also look at e-bikes, you know, electric bikes that can go on the trail when we need to do uh, any enforcement that's on the trail or at the mall. Uh, I mentioned the UAVs, any 3D training where we can immerse officers into a setting where that they need to respond in a safe environment. Um, we've got our uh, scenario-based training that we've used. Bothell has a system called Virtua Training that we attended where you can get a little shock when you get shot. And uh, it's pretty fun to watch the officers uh, go through that training. <laughs> it's, uh, um, well, I was going to go into a story, yeah. but. <laughs> I saw that coming. Uh, Red Dot is a, is a utility that's used on our firearms. There's going to be a day where I'm going to bring my firearms guys to just explain how we use firearms, what guns we use, why we use them, what's the equipment that we use, and kind of go into that at some point. Um, and then electric patrol vehicles. I do would like to see that happen one day where we can have our patrol cars pull in plug in and be electric. I think that they, um, the torque on them is amazing. So if we need to go after somebody and get some, somebody quick, great. And then they are very quiet when they're you know, prowling around at night looking for bad guys <laughs> and uh, trying to you know, break into homes and burglarize and that kind of stuff. So um, that is something that we, we do need to look at as a city. And I know that this whole group is very uh, climate action um, incentivized. So that is something that I'd like to see. I, I know there's going to be a path where we're going to have to probably do hybrid for a little while just until we get to that point. Um, and then there's some other creative events. We, I'm looking at doing some kind of a hero day and then other events that we're looking at, but we're still going to do safety day, Shabba the Cop, National Night Out. And then one thing that we have not done as a city is Citizens Academy. And uh, Lieutenant Zanilla is in the uh, working phase of that. And at some point, I think a July, August, um, somewhere in that time period, we're going to have a Citizens Academy where citizens, preferably the city council joining at first, maybe being our, um, our guinea pigs, but basically going through what does a police department do? And it, it talks about all the different aspects from investigations to traffic stops to why do we do this? Why do we do that? 
So if you're familiar with the Citizens Academy, we want to get that rolling. And part of those funds are going to probably come from the foundation because we want to give back to the community on, on these aspects. So that kind of wraps up what our, our future is. There's uh, a lot more, but I, I wanted to just thank the community, uh, the council, and all the city staff for your support, um, particularly the mayor. Uh, it's, I'm at these council meetings all the time and you all are praising uh, the police department and the mayor has been such a vocal voice for us and, and it, it means a lot to us. Um, every one of you like to talk about, you know, pass on the, uh, the proud aspect of it. Um, and I do tell them and I pass on these messages, um, but I really want to put it back to you because we can't do our job if we don't have the support of mayor and staff, uh, council. Uh, it really comes back to you. See a lot of dysfunctional city councils in the region, some areas around here and, and out of the states. You just see these horror stories. We have an amazing council for, I know, at least 12, 15 years. That, oh, well, 20 years I've been here. Maybe some will fight a little bit now and again, but you guys have been amazing. So I want to first off say that we appreciate you guys. And I don't know if there's anything else to say. Good. All right. Mayor, back to you. Questions? I know you all want to say something, so <laughs> Councilmember Ferratani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank, thank you, Chief and Lieutenants, for all the work you do and your staff as well. Um, your point about the professionalism being job one is very well taken. Um, I think that our citizens here very much are, uh, appreciate the work that you do and the way in which they're treated. So um, one of the questions that I had, just turning the comment on 180 degrees, is I'm intrigued by your use of UAVs. And I'm wondering, um, I, you said that there might be a presentation later in the year on this, but uh, I'm kind of interested in finding out if they're going to be an augment to patrolling, are they going to be a special event thing? Because these things take a lot of training, they take a lot of maintenance, and uh, you know, there, there's just a lot of uh, nuts and bolts kind of things involved with these. I'm wondering, so what do you see as the use of the UAV? So... Just right now, we use the UAVs quite a bit, actually, for our own um, calls. And uh, I have not heard this many times where they're like, hey, can you call for a drone out right now? Uh, we did have one. Do you remember the incident that we had across the street? There was a drone up. And what that particular instance has, it's, an, it's, it's overwatch for everybody. So you have a drone that is set over all of the scene. They can see any kind of movement, anybody that's in the area, and they're watching from a command post. So they know if somebody's in that particular area. So it's a good overwatch system. We've used it for a lot of public safety for um, uh, traffic accidents. Drones have been popped up and they mapped out the traffic areas or the, the collisions, and they get downloaded into computer systems and the data is able to make the scenes way faster than when we used to use total station which are these devices where you're standing out there uh, doing measurements and it takes a long time, stops the roadway for you know hours at a time. So drones have been used to uh, map out those scenes. We've uh, used them for um, missing persons where somebody's missing in the woods, we get that uh, unit up and they're able to um, uh, look for through FLIR or night vision or heat. Uh, um, I can't remember the word, but the uh, heat signatures. And um, we can use Guardian One. Uh, right now, I think the legislature is trying to find the funding to get uh, a new King County helicopter in. And I think it's pretty close to being done, if not done. Uh, but that is very expensive. And so if we were to call Guardian One, we really have to have a good reason. But if we call Muckleteo and say, hey, can we use your drone? Because we've got somebody um, that is uh, missing in the woods, you know, those kind of things. Um, Lieutenant Lehman, I don't know if there's any other examples that we've used, but I know that we've had. If I did a keyword search of UAV or drone right now, it's been used quite a few times. Um, and Bothell, for example, has a UAV drone that is a tethered unit. It can stay up in the air indefinitely because it's hooked up to a, a battery system and it gives really good overwatch of whatever's going on. So it, it's able to show. And I understand that some of the SWAT operators have these units where you can actually see the drone footage on their phones. So they can go in particular areas and it's safer. And the SWAT units have used them to clear out houses where we've had hostage situations. So instead of sending uh, uh, dogs or officers in a, a residence where you risk something happening, you're able to put a drone in. And a lot of times the, the person has um, deceased because of whatever the scene is. And now they're able to go in and clear the rooms safely as opposed to put that human element in there. So those are some brief ones, but I'm taking away the, um, 
the, the power of uh, Sergeant Adams' presentation. Um, he's been working on. I, I got tasked with this back in like 2017, 2018, but there's just been so many things and I just never got around to it. Um, and then I keep getting bugged by officers. Hey, we really need to do this. And then our foundation wants to donate a drone UAVs to Mill Creek and to us. And I said, well, I need my city council to be completely transparent what the use is because there's so many fears with it. Um, and I want to dispel those fears, but I think, I don't know of very many agencies that don't have it in our region now, to be honest with you. Um, were you going to say something there? Well, I was going to say on that call that we discussed with uh, Spencer and uh, Fran, they actually got a drone out. We didn't know what a shooter was. And uh, we discovered through a whole lot of talking that he runs this way, but we couldn't find him in the wooded area. So we actually had a drone come up to see if we could find him once they're down there because so someday um when he's ready to go with his presentation we'll have that for the whole group um and i hope to soon so that you understand where we're coming from on that technology right thank you anybody else have any questions yes. member riddle yeah briefly i, I want to commend your commitment to your uh, officers and your department for mental, mental and physical health. Um, th they do see and experience a lot that we don't just un can understand, but you've been really active uh, and I just uh, ab about giving them access and, and I appreciate what you've been able to do thus far. And I understand that you've, you wanna go further. I think the gym for that physical aspect, um, some of the tools you have for the mental health. Um, so just wanted to recognize that um, you're leading uh, in the right direction, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Um, it's, it's hard to hear stories about officers who don't have that support. And I'm glad that we are building a support system here for our officers. I, I was listening to a podcast from a military guy and he said, trauma is trauma. Everybody is going to experience trauma sometime in their life. Um, just the death of a loved one. Trauma is trauma no matter what. But the, the repeated trauma is what is really harsh when officers have to see that um, time and time again. I mean, Brandon um, has been in three different situations where it was pretty extreme trauma. And he's kind of a newer guy. And it's like, man, you get some 15 year, 20 year folks that don't see as much all of a sudden. But um, trauma is trauma. Everybody in this room has experienced it one way or another. It's just that repeated stuff that uh, gets to you. Thank you. Councilmember Casover. Yes, thank you. Um, so, Chief, you, you know I'm a big fan of you and your department. I just think that you have the values and um, the approach that this community is right with you on that, and I just really deeply appreciate all of that. Um, one question that I do have when we were, and maybe it, this is Lieutenant Lehman can help us on this one, it's just my, uh, you know, anecdotal experience that I'm seeing a heck of a lot of speeding out there, <laughs> and um, particularly on Bothell Way, and um, I sort of don't see that reflected in the data that you showed us, and I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. Of course, we also do see the the sort of racing phenomenon. I just was on Bothell Way myself. Let me see, when was it? Um, what's the day? Thursday? Tuesday. And uh, two BMW, you know, little sport coupe things, you know, fortunately they turned left onto 100, uh, they turned onto 145th Street, so they didn't come all the way up through Lake Forest Park, but crazy. I mean, what what are you seeing out there and, and how can, what can we do to help with that or deal with it? Because it looks dangerous. It is. I, I agree. Um, people have become more aggressive since um, COVID has eased up and people have gone back to work and, and we see a lot of that. Unfortunately, I don't have the staff to go out there and address it as much as uh, it needs to be addressed. I, we don't have the time because we're going to these other calls that are, you know, when people call, we have to go. And when my officers go out there, the two officers, again, I will give you an example for um, uh, Brendan and or Brent, Brandon and Benson. <laughs> It's very hard to work with these guys. <laughs> um, they go out and make traffic stops for half the day and people don't stop for them two or three times a day. They just go. And this leads to, you saw on the thing, they say, well, I'm not stopping. And they take off at a high rate of speed. 
So that that leads to it because people feel like they don't they don't have to stop. The cops can't chase me. We've actually been told that by people. Yeah, I don't have to stop for you. Um, so we're trying as best we can. We go to hotspot areas as best we can, but I just don't have the staff right now. And we've had to pull um, Officer Walker, who's our traffic officer. He'll have to go to these large events because this just sucks up all our staff when we go to a shooting or you know an assault or something like that. And it, again, it takes days to do the paperwork on these things. That's the super fun part of law enforcement is, is all the paperwork. But we're aware of it and we get out there as much as we can. I know that those guys in particular are out there every day and they did the distracted driving emphasis recently and uh, wrote probably 30, 40 tickets with only nine hours over three days. Oh, So well, we're out well, there, they just come back if we're not visible 24 seven, yeah. Well, thank you. I just I just wanted to check and make sure that my perception was not out of line here. So thank you. Uh -huh. Deputy Mayor French. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, first of all, I wanted to start off by saying that the three of you just exemplify the culture of, of, of the department and your leadership has been exemplary and, and it really shows the values uh, that our community really has looked for. I mean, you uh, seeing your officers out there on stops talking with the officers out there in the community at the schools and various things. It's just quite extraordinary. And, and I, it's a, it's a real testament to you, to the three of your leadership and yours chief particularly, because it's, it's one of those things that the pride and culture is just incredible. And, um, and while we have, you know, on our borders, so to speak, we have some really serious challenging problems. Um, the numbers show, uh, unequivocally that your department is doing an outstanding job in helping keep things, you know, tamped down. As you said, there's always room for improvement, but beyond the pale, you you all are putting your necks out there and doing something that is a terribly challenging job that the community is in, immensely grateful for. So I wanna make sure that the community continues to thank you. And I put that word out there. Uh, I also, I really wanted to thank you for your, uh, we talked about this before, your commitment to wellness. I mean, I know your presentation from a couple of weeks ago really illustrates uh, the, the commitment of the department and yours chief to making sure that your officers have a holistic approach to making sure that de dealing with tragic events or traumatic events that have occurred like the recently um that they they have the opportunity to get the support that they need as well as preemptively being able to be be well whether it's through physical fitness or mental fitness and i and we all applaud you for that i'm disappointed that the police pursuit bill looks like it's not going to be revised in the legislature it's just something we've been watching very closely as well as the blake decision um I, i'm very disappointed on those uh, relative to those because I believe that the, the, the pendulum needs to swing back in the direction of, of doing uh, things that is, um, uh, you know, at least some moderation uh, and, and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, which was what happened a couple years ago. I would agree. So I hope that going forward, uh, we will all be able to jump, do the polar bear plunge with you all. Oh, and yeah. um, and I know the mayor really wants to do that. So, so. <laughs> Chief did it in his uniform, so. That's because it's all insulated. He had a diving suit. <laughs> <underneath. laughs> That's what it was. It was, a, it was not your, your vest. It was a, a dry suit underneath, right? Um, so. Thank you. Council Member Bodie. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief and Lieutenants, for another excellent presentation. It's always helpful to um, hear the overview of what's happening, and, uh, you know, I am always um, not surprised, but uh, almost disappointed that our, our police department has to deal with so many challenging and and difficult situations where their physical safety is is in question. That is, you know, something that I, I as you know, I didn't think we had in Lake Forest Park. And um, the awareness is good for me and for our community of the difficult situations you deal with. I I um, I noted the increase in theft at Town Center, and uh, I've noticed that in the city administrator reports as well. So I do want to say the annual report is so informative, and so I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the ongoing reporting that you do. 
um, with the uh, with the city administrators report and social media. I think uh, the regular reporting of the incidents um, in social media is helpful for our community to know how much you're doing to keep us um, to keep us safe. So. Uh, good luck. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed on on the new hiring, and uh, and like Council Member French, I'm I'm disappointed um, that we didn't get better uh, legislative updates uh, that where it doesn't look like we're going to, and that's that I think is frustrating for us as a community, and especially frustrating for uh, for the officers. So, thank you very much once again. You know um, I'm a supporter and. Uh, uh, the three of you especially provide tremendous leadership for the group. I want to thank you as, as leaders of, of our department, especially. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bodie. And I want to say with social media, it's the three of us. And we have a lot on our plate as it is, and we try the best we can. I wish we had a social media person like most big departments that can handle just that. I mean, Bothell and Kirkland hired news folks to handle this stuff. So we've got to try and do that and trying to manage that has been difficult, but we've done the best we can. I think it's it's admirable what we've gotten out there, but just understand it's really just the three of us that are like, we got to get this message out. Um, so, and we do recognize what the community is asking for, um, but we try to manage our normal job with that kind of stuff. I completely understand that. And I just want to say thank you for what you have been doing, because I I do think it is helpful to the community. So thank you for doing it in the, the little spaces that you can in between your uh, your uh, major jobs. So uh, but, you know, you have skills now. Maybe you could, you know, go on <laughs> and work for Amazon or something. Uh, I got three more years here. OK. <laughs> <laughs> at least I got to get that retirement age. So. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Goldman. Um, yeah, I'll also add my gratitude. I, I really appreciate you and your officers um, taking a very community centered approach to policing. Um, I try to follow state legislation, though it, it can be a bit overwhelming at times. Um, I'll slightly contradict, I think, Deputy Mayor French and Councilmember Bodie. I believe there is something moving through, um, both on uh, vehicular pursuits and on the uh, Blake uh, drug bill. Um, I imagine it'll go to a conference committee for the State House and Senate. So I would look forward to getting an update from you in the next few weeks yeah. as to what actually, because I, I expect something will pass. So I look forward to getting an update as to what has passed and how it will change your team's policing strategy for the city. I will, I, I will agree with you completely. Um, I did get an update from our WASPIC president today at our King County Chiefs meeting, um, basically where the Blake and Pursuit Bill is. Um, but I, there's going to be a lot of moving parts in the next nine days, because that's basically, I think, at nine, 10 days is when everything is shut down, 10 days. So everything will be shut down. So right now, I know that they're working on it. There was a really good Senate bill. I'm glad you brought this up. I want to do a shout out to... Uh, um, uh, Shoreline, Jesse Solomon. Um, he wrote a really good bill for the um, pursuit bill, I believe, that the Senate had passed. Um, didn't go as well in the House as far as law enforcement is concerned, um, but right now I think they're trying to work through what they're going to do. Um, and so we, I still, I believe we need a few more days to figure out where uh, it's going to go. Um, the Blake particular one, if it does not pass, by the way, if this does not happen, the current law sunsets in July, which means in July, all drugs are legal, period. Yeah, There's nothing else to it. Um, if they do pass it, if they do what the, um, and actually, I think it was um, uh, Mr. Solomon's bill was Blake, where all of the drug possession will be, he put forward, I believe, a gross misdemeanor. Um, and then the house is looking at misdemeanor. If they do do that, that is going to put a load on our court. So we do need to recognize what will happen there because then the officers will do um, arrests of anybody that has possession of drugs. And then that'll go through our court where it used to be a felony. And that went through the King County court system, um, the superior court. So it's something that we'll have to pay attention to and what kind of load that puts on. Um, the officers are still going to, they still were doing their job when it was a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor. Some of the processes will change, but that's something that we'll need to pay attention to if Blake does that. Yes. 
just It'll quickly, just quickly on point, Candace Bach from Association of Washington Cities gave us an update last night at the Sound City Spick. I was going to save this for later, but since you all are here, the three decisions right now, the Blake decision, they, AWC calls it a bit of a mess, and yeah. it's yeah. the chances of it getting sorted out between the House and Senate look that's really challenging. What it comes out on the other end may be so laundered that it's de minimis in terms of its impact. That's the problem there. Um, relative to, you know, the misdemeanor question, which I think it was, it was a, it's a very interesting approach and, and we'll give a great shout out to our friend, Jesse uh, in Shoreline. I think that the, the, the question that AWC had was the burden, the question of the burden to the courts and what the system would look like. Mm -hmm. I do think that getting something moving forward is, is better than nothing. I, I want, everyone understand that we don't want to put people in jail because they do drugs right. that is nowhere near what any of us agree with but we do have to have consequences to get folks to get help so if we can get them to the people that can get them help and there's actual real um consequences for not doing things yeah. and it'll work but if the current way that the house has kind of ate up that um bill there doesn't seem to be a lot. They've kind of gutted it too, or it's not. It's not going to be productive. Um, but we all would like to see folks that are on drugs get the yeah, help. Period. Absolutely. Passing out flyers right now to say go get help a couple of times, and that does nothing. And it has been unsuccessful. Uh, but if it doesn't pass, um, it'll be tough to what we're we're going to go forward. Eventually, we're going to get there. I just know we will. Some point. Our communities, our councils will pass some bills, but yeah. And the last thing is the police pursuit bill. They, their AWC says it's probably too narrow to be effective for departments right now. So, yeah. and no matter what happens with the pursuit bill, day in and day out, nothing changes for normally what we're seeing. We're still going to see the same thing. They're just changing. If they were to pass it, they're changing from uh, probable cause to reasonable suspicion which may, makes it a little bit lower threshold for us to go and find out who is behind this vehicle. But what everybody under, needs to understand is we have policies. Lake Forest Park Police Department has a policy on pursuits. So regardless if the legislator, legislation said, you have free reign, go stop whoever you want. And that's the new bill. It doesn't happen here. Yeah. We have policies that say, you can't go after somebody for these particular rules. So um, it, it's really just done the, it's changed the attitude of the public is what it's done, not necessarily how we do our police work. Right. Thank you, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add there. Thank you. Yes, Council Member Lebo. Thank you. I, I wanna express, and my sentiments are, are as the council members have expressed, and, and it's really about gratitude for the amazing work that you and your officers and detectives do every day. Um, we see you driving around in the community and you wave, and we know that if we need help, uh, you will be there and you will be there very quickly. It's really quite a tragedy what's happened to our society with the influx of really cheap and very dangerous drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, I agree with you, we shouldn't imprison somebody for the use of drugs, but drugs have really um, been quite, um, how do I say, tragic for our society in general. Um, it's one thing to take a drug, but the drugs are now screwing people up. Um, the mental health issues that we have today and the impact of that is tremendous. And it really speaks to the professionalism of your entire department and the thoughtfulness that you have and the way you care and treat people. Um, and that's really important because it reflects uh, I think very well on the community to see the values that you express and the care that you have for these people who really truly de do need help. Uh, prison is not the right solution. Um, and it will take society as a whole to find solutions. Um, but we thank you for being on the Vanguard to help us every day. Thank you, council member. And you said that people wave. Uh, we've had several ride-alongs with laterals that have come in to, you know, we get them to get out there to kind of take a look at our police department. They are come back so surprised at our community that everybody waves to us. And, and it's, <laughs> it's funny to hear that because you don't get that at other agencies. <laughs>
Any I will budget? just lastly say that you all have the 22 annual report. There was some errors in there in the, the uh, report I sent you. We corrected those. Um, I, it was, I had to put all that data together. So I'm going to make mistakes. I fixed those mistakes. The published version um, has the, the right version. I don't know if you had any questions on numbers. I can answer those. Um, that's it. Thank you, Chief. Um, I was a lot better mood before you started talking. Um, you're not going to get any Teslas or anything. You're going to get armored cars <laughs> because I'm tired of watching our cars get pinned like pinballs. And I'm going to tell everybody in this room, this isn't laughing. We're lucky. So far, one of these guys hasn't killed a kid walking across the street. Yep. And when that happens, I want to know who is responsible. And I'll tell you who's responsible. Everybody down Olympia that keeps doing this stuff they don't understand how detrimental it is to the citizens that we protect. You guys do a fantastic job and we as a city and you as a council, we are gonna to have to make decisions because we can't be just on this edge of just barely having a police department. We have got to make financial decisions and three people, if we get all three of those hires, it's still not gonna take care of the traffic problem because we don't have enough people to be better than we are. I'm not, you guys are fantastic. You know, I love you, I'd do anything for you. I'm just frustrated that, Tom has to sit here and say, we're not going to get any help. And I don't know where the disconnect is in the world that you're sitting here. You guys are putting your lives on the line. We're all trying to take care of citizens and we're not getting the help we need. So, but you guys are wonderful. Um, Thank you, Ben. And you guys all need to go home and go to bed. You've been here since yeah. five in the morning. <laughs> so enjoy your evening. Thank you. And I, I'm, the whole council of you, you guys do a Thank great you. job. Stay safe. Hey, Matt, this is an exciting time for you. Come back out in the front the row. Big reveal. <laughs> okay. Let me know if you want a drum roll. <laughs> I think you might need it. <laughs> it was working before, now it's not. Our new city emblem is a picture of the council. I know. <laughs> okay. So um, just starting off, um, our current city site is run by or hosted by Civic Plus. Um, last year, we found out that we were owed a free upgrade, so we took advantage of it. Um, started off with a small team. I think the last time they did this, it was like probably 20 people or more. <laughs> Um, so I kept it down to four people and we looked at many, many websites. I had Joanne, our deputy city clerk on it, Aaron, our IT manager, just because he's IT. He said he was going to show up, but I guess he didn't. Um, and Kelsey was a great help from PD and she really helped us narrow in because we looked at way too many sites and couldn't figure out what we wanted for for our site. So really we focused on the words lake, forest, and park and tried to incorporate that into our new site. So with that, they came up, Civic Plus came up with this. Now this is just a static image and if I can do this. I'll show you a more robust image. So you'll see, first off, before our current site is just kind of a square box in the middle with a background picture. So these pictures right here, they'll rotate, it'll change just like it does now. Um, you'll notice that the banner, the picture goes above the banner, so it's kind of very much in the background. 
Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out, um, there's a little kind of water wave oh. <laughs> underneath those. And scrolling down, you'll see that we incorporated the tree line into the site. And these are just popular links that are kind of there. But if you'll notice as I'm scrolling down, these bottom mm -hmm. links, they always stay on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So these navigations oh, went too far. Well, that's a go back. These are the most popular links uh -huh. that are currently on our site. Um, we did a turn it. Stop doing that. Um, we did a uh, kind of hot spot placement of most popular links. Um, technically, none of these are the most popular links. <laughs> most things that people come to our site for are actually passports and how to set a passport and appointment and the court and how to pay a ticket. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Um, so part of the other thing I wanted to point out, um, you probably can't see it on here, but there's actually kind of a wood grain behind here. Um, we rearranged the calendar to make it more kind of user-friendly to try and put things um, down here. This used to be actually sailboats and we changed it to to trees. And then an interior page. This is an interior page. So if you looked at our current site, it's kind of shifted off to the right. So now it's more center. Um, it's important to remember that this is just kind of the basic background, none of the content, all the content will be changed, updated. So we'll probably go back and rearrange some of these these links up here and that's basically the site so i'm going to stop right there see if anybody has any comments or something that you guys hate that you want changed <laughs> where's the new logo that's coming up oh, okay Yes, <laughs> just quickly uh i'll be brief looks great thanks matt and team no. good <laughs> make it easy yeah now i have to go back <laughs> so when we were working on the website, we looked at our logo and said, that's really out of date. So we started to think about what we needed for the logo. We needed, wanted to make it a little bit more modern. Um, really the outline of this logo, even though it looks like it's, we can see the background, it's actually a square. So we really went for a more circle shape and we really wanted to kind of keep all the aspects of the city name in there. So what we came up with, and this is actually really part of um, Aaron's, <laughs> Aaron's and his son worked on this primarily. So everything has pretty much been done in-house where I think a lot of cities spend tens of thousands of dollars on branding. So, okay, here it is. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Nice. There it is. Yep. Let you stare at it. Any comments on it? Something <laughs> you hate? Oh. Yes, it's me really. I, I'm really impressed with the uh, website. It's it's very modern. It's very clean. It's um it's very similar to when you look around at other cities and other agencies that have their websites. Um, I, I, I. The logo 
I, I just can't say it. As great as the website is, the logo is, in my opinion, is just the opposite. There's there's nothing modern about it. The logo that we have today is quite distinctive. Uh, when you go and look at others, this could be Issaquah. It could be Puyallup. It could be somewhere else. It just doesn't, to me, say Lake Forest Park. I. I think the logo that we have is quite distinctive. One of the things I like about it is it is rather simple. It reflects the lake, the forest, and um, an image that is recognizable. Um, I think there are a lot of logos out there for cities and municipalities and that are just very complicated um, and just overdone. This, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, no. Anybody else? Yes, Councilmember Goldman. Um, yep, yeah, thanks for this. I, I have a question about the website, thinking about functionality. Do you have a feel from members of the public about where they are struggling with the current website? They're having, are they having trouble finding certain information? And is that something that you're looking to address with the, the this upgrade? I am looking to address some of those um, problems. A lot of it has to do with search. Um, functions in the built into the website. Um, I found that there's currently some dead ends on the website that need to be taken off. Um, they're, they're, they're easy fixes, but nobody's actually sat down and really try to narrow down. Like if you search for code violations, I think you'll get like three old links that are still up for some strange reason that we need to take down. Um, I had somebody the other day that had asked me where the code violation form was, so I had to point them to the right site to find it. But it's just, uh, that's one of those things that you just can't, you can't fix everybody's the way that people use websites. It's just, we can do what we can to make it as easy as we can. Thanks. Yes, Council Member Riddle. Thank you. This is a lovely seal. Um, as a logo, I'm I'm trying to understand if we need a logo being sort of different than our seal. And it's 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 sort of the aspect of that easy recognizable, noticing it as the police car goes by, like or you know what you know our P P public works truck goes by. You don't have time to take all of this in in those sorts of instances. There's also, I think, some like seven different colors in there, which yeah. makes it beautiful and colorful. But again, it's it's challenging with like replicability, um, you know, printing costs if we make things with the logo on it. So I like it as a seal. I'm just, you know, there's a there's different qualities for a logo than a seal. And I think the question is, what were we going for? Um, and so if we're going to push to a logo, I think that simplification it would be more important. So I like it, but I think as a logo, it's a little complicated and it doesn't read as a logo, it reads as a seal, if that makes some sense. Um, so that's my thoughts. Um, I love the effort that went into it, for sure. Okay. Yes, Councilman Cass, over. Thank you very much. And and Matt, I'm really looking forward to, you know, a, a wholesale update of the website. It, it really does need it. Um, and um, I take, uh, I, I, I myself sometimes have a hard time finding things on it uh, at the moment. And so I have one question about that. Our municipal code right now, is, is, that, is that software that, that handles the municipal code? Is that something that we're getting from a vendor that is kind of out of our control? Uh, what do you mean out of our control? Well, I mean that they... They manage it. We don't manage it. Is that right? Right. It's hosted on a separate service. Right. Okay, good. So I, I figured that, but um, I just wanted to be sure. And then I'm going to echo uh, Council Member Riddle's thoughts about the logo. Too many colors, too much going on. And a logo is something that needs instant recognition for it. And I'm not sure this one's going to do that for us. The one we have right now is actually pretty effective. I, I can understand that it looks it looks like it was designed when it was designed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
effects, but but the effectiveness of it is actually still pretty good. And I'm just not sure that this one is going to be the same immediate recognition kind of um, as exactly as Councilman Riddle said when the when the public works truck goes by, you're not. This is going to be harder to 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 just. Ooh, yeah, that's Lake Forest Park. So, um, thank uh, Aaron and his son very much, and maybe they could work on it a little more and take and really get it down to two to three colors, or we really, you know, something very instantly recognizable and just very simple. Um, just to help my staff out a little bit, if you guys have some suggestions or some ideas, please send them to them. Okay. Um, I do have a lot of talent. So um, I would like that very much because we would like some ideas or they'd like some ideas on what you guys would like. Uh, Deputy Mayor French. Yeah, just uh, Matt, I understand your frustration about search. It's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Uh, I'm an administrator on a technical forum and we were having problems with our internal search. And I figured out that if I went out and Googled something, actually on Google, I could get a better search result on our forum than I could through our own internal search. So it's it's a, it's a real challenge. And to those legacy links that come up in some of these older search systems are really a challenge. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer ask, answer them if I can, but it, it is, okay. no, I, we've all been there, so hang in there. <laughs> Yes, Council Member. Very short follow-up question. Um, does the new website have the opportunity for like fillable, submittable forms for things uh, like we do have? Or whatever? That's a broader department issue. Okay. Um, there <laughs> are a few forms that are online that are fillable and can be submitted directly into the website. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many forms. Uh, I think most of them are court related mm -hmm. um, but a lot of planning forms are fillable pdfs yeah i think uh from a, from a access equity standpoint the more that we can make it something we can just type in and submit okay. in the long run i think that's going to be much ben much more beneficial for our community than a fillable form they have to print out and somehow send in so that's thank you a, for thinking about that yeah i've been thinking about that a lot and it's a broader issue that <laughs> trying to move everybody in so, so far. Okay. What else? Okay. Good job. Tell them thank you. Um I guess we're gonna work on the logo a little bit or the seal. Um yeah. but and thank you, Matt, for you've done a whole lot of work since you've been here changing and updating us and making us uh better every day. So I appreciate it. So um We'll probably work on updating the website with the old logo. It doesn't really matter. That won't stop anything. So that will probably in the next, <clears throat> I want to say the next three or four months, we'll have a new website up. Okay. And, and, and like I said, in the meantime, if you have suggestions for Matt, just send them to him. Um, I'll give you his personal phone number if you'd yeah. like. <laughs> You have engaged with us. It seems like we can Matt, have you, you need to go anyway. back here and we're going to move on, buddy. Thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate that. Um, now we're going to move, which I thought was going to happen for Andy about two and a half hours ago. So, Andy, we're going to, yes. We get a stretch break, Mayor. Let that, let's let Andy go. He's got to you, get you, home. He's got a family. He'll be so. quick, sir, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as you don't ask questions, he'll be really quick. <laughs> Come on in, Andy. Man, hurting over here. Knock it out. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I will try to keep this as quick as I can. Um, so I'm here to um, seek the council's authorization to um, have the mayor sign an agreement with uh, a um, stormwater services uh, vendor for catch basin inspection and uh, data collection services. So um, I guess the difficult part of this is that I am you know, taking the unusual step of just kind of coming right out and asking council to consider suspending uh, your standard three touch process uh, for actions of this type. Um, the easier, more straightforward part of it, I think is, is, is everything else. So the, you know, starting with the, the nature of the work and the driver, this is work that we're required to do every two years as part of the NPDES stormwater permit. 
Um, so this year's deadline is, is August, uh, or this cycle's deadline is August 1st of this year. Um, and yeah, I'll be, I'll be candid. One of the reasons I'm kind of in a little bit of a rush on this is I'm beginning uh, a family leave starting May 1st. And so I'm hoping to um, be able to have time to participate in like a kickoff discussion with the vendor um, after the contract is, is executed. It's not, you know, the work will still proceed. Um, it's not the end of the world if I, if I can't be there for that. You know, we have um, uh, resources, you know, lined up to, to help support the work that I'm doing in my absence, but it's, uh, it's best if, uh, if I can participate in that. So that's some that's a benefit that you know taking action tonight would um, would enable. Um, and then you know all else I, I really want to share about it is um, you know this is this is work you know because it's a municipal stormwater permit driven thing it's it's work that we're fully you know um, planning for when we developed our you know biennial budget request. So we actually budgeted for I think about fifteen thousand dollars more than what the low bid uh, came in for for this contract. Um, we had much better participation in this procurement than we did the last time uh, we bid this work. Um, we had six six bids submitted. I think that the last time we did this, we actually had zero, and we had to uh, negotiate directly with a vendor um, following that that uh, that process that that didn't uh, that didn't bear any fruit. But we had a very competitive process this time around, um, very competitive price and. Um, yeah, on the funding side, everything um, everything is uh, you know the funding that we have is adequate, and um, yeah, it, it's um, I mean you know as far as work that DPW does, I, I think this is pretty you know, straightforward, you know, routine stuff. So that's the um, that those are the basics of the request. Um, certainly happy to answer any questions you might have. Council Member Levo. Uh, thank you. No question on the. Um the scope of this work. Uh, is there a separate scope to actually clean out the uh, catch basins? And yes. does that occur on what kind of frequency? So the way these, um, the way the cleaning requirements work is there's specific thresholds that uh, that we're required to, to be measuring for in these inspections. And so if the inspection exceeds, if the catch basin is found to exceed that threshold, um, then we have six months from the date of the inspection to get the cleaning done. And so the way we've done that in the past is we've, we've issued a standalone, you know, separate contract for the, for the cleaning work. Um, and it's, you know, in the future, we're hoping to make this part of a single unit price public works contract, just less contracting, you know, to do, uh, you know, it's one benefit of it. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the plan is they'll wrap this up by August and then we'll have, you know, up to get right to work on that cleaning contract, and but they'll have plenty of time to uh, to get that work done. Early. It's just that it would be nice to get it done before the rainy season. So, uh, I, I I mean the the catch basin cleaning. If the catch basin's full, you know the best time to clean it is before the rainy season starts. Yeah, that'll that'll depend. So I'm coming back in July, and um, I mean that'll be. I mean I have the con. The nice thing about it is I have that contract written. You know, it's it's a contract we've done. Uh, We've issued, I think, as recently as uh, about six months ago, and um, yeah, I think there's a there's a good chance that we can get most of that that work done before you know the heaviest rain arrives. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Ferrantani, then Council Member Castover. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and th thank you, uh, Madam Chair Sylvia, for uh, um, going through all this process and interviewing all those companies. I'm just kind of wondering: is it normal for there to be like a factor of two between the low and the high? And I noticed that you know the highest pace who we've hired in the past before. So, is there a reason why they came in so high compared to the bids that you know we 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 ultimately accept? I was I was kind of surprised to see Pace and the Watershed Company bidding on this work because they're 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 a professional engineering company. You, you know, you typically see more like purchased service type, uh, you know, think public works crew members are, are the ones typically, you know, that level of expertise doing this work. And, you know, Pace did about $100,000 on it, which is about twice the low bid, I think mainly because they were going to send somebody with an engineering degree uh, out, you know, to do this work. And so they're, they're much more expensive. Um, I think they were just taking a shot and maybe hoping 
what happened last time happened this time where we didn't get any bids and <laughs> their their crazy price would be uh would be the lowest you know would be, so. <laughs> makes but, sense no, thanks no, that's right. yes. council member cast over uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to um, ask my colleagues if we could uh, move to um, to dispense with our three-touch rule and be able to take care of this matter this evening. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to remove our three-touch rule on Resolution 23-1891. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays passed unanimously? Would anybody like to move resolution? I'll go ahead and move. Um, I'll get back to the resolution now. 23. Resolution uh, 23-1891, authorizing the mayor to sign services agreement with ventilation power cleaning for catch basin inspection and data collection services for 2023. Second. Okay, it's moved and second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of resolution 23-1891, please say aye. 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 Any, any nays? Okay, pass unanimously. Thank you, sir. Go home. Have a good evening. Much. We will take a five-minute break, and we will be right back. Perfect. Go my feet. <laughs> <laughs> Ten counters and move and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. Move on to ordinance and resolution for council discussion. Draft ordinance 23-1263, creating chapter 12.50 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code retaining laws. Mr. Bennett, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we um our uh, primary uh, reason for having this back on the agenda is to see if uh, with uh, the changes in the attached um, version, uh, you're ready to go ahead and schedule a public hearing uh, for the um, <clears throat> this this uh, the, the right away wall design or the, uh, the retaining wall design guidelines and regulations. Um, the we've uh, been playing a little tag team here, so I just wanted to walk through the changes that didn't get sort of shown as track changes in the ordinance. Uh, and um, just to make sure you're all familiar with uh, those uh, after discussion with staff and with hearing council discussion, uh, we ended up um, removing uh, C from C1, uh, the um, require or the prohibition on wall timber or concrete lagging walls. Uh, understand from public works that you know that that could be a type of wall they would uh, want to have behind whatever design you know finish uh, they, they feel like that's uh, workable um, the other change was we've made the uh, maintenance um, the three-year monitoring plan for trees the same as the one for landscaping uh, so that <clears throat> uh, in, in in response to comments and and uh, just keeping it uh, fairly straightforward. So, and then the, the one change to the design guidelines uh, since the last discussion was just, is, is uh, just leaving uh, the number four uh, provision on the last page of the guidelines, 60, page 61 and part of your packet. Uh, we've taken out um, as a minimum, the wall shall have a diffuse pattern with reduced, uh, that reduces sound reverberation. So after a discussion with council, it just seemed like that that was a difficult standard to, to meet, but we're still leaving in that sound attenuation shall be um, uh, considered in the design of the wall. Um, and so uh, we, um, you know, I've also just, if, if you feel like, you know, you're comfortable with those changes, um, we, uh, I, I think the first uh, opportunity to have a public hearing would be the first meeting in May. I think that's the, the 11th of May. Um, and so the, we, we might, we have to receive some comments from Sound Transit. We might want to come back to you uh, the second meeting of this month, just to let you know how we're thinking about dealing with that. We just got them um, yesterday. So, uh, and I think some of them are just like, you know, we're there uh, maybe just an understanding of how the guidelines will work. We can, re, re, you know, 
take some of those off the list. So, um, but uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have about the changes we've made since the last discussion of this. And uh, would um, like to uh, uh, let me know if there's anything else that, uh, that would keep us from having a public hearing on the, uh, the first meeting of May. Thank you. Council Member Riddle. Um, just a comment I, that for the sound, sound attenuation, it, to me, considered um, means they could consider it and ignore it. I don't know if addressed is a more appropriate if what? language. Sound attenuation should be considered. Yeah, we considered it and we're not going to do it. So like, I guess perhaps if there's some stronger language that they have to address it in some way. In other words, they have to provide us some sort of, we tried it, it didn't work. We're not going to do it, but like I guess that that just felt like a stronger language to me, and I think I've heard the council really want to to make sure that that's somehow shown to us that either they're putting it in or they're not, or they have some sort of justification for that. So um, I'd like to see considered it changed to maybe addressed. So, All right, so the attorney has a there. quote. Um, I think the reason we were comfortable with considered is that we know there are wash dot standards for the noise impact of these walls, and we. LFP, we don't have any studies, information. Council may decide to do that later, but we don't have that information now to deal with any noise impacts regarding these walls. So that's why um, considered seemed the appropriate word. Okay. Okay, because I, my I was thinking addressed. We met wash dot standards would be how they would address it. Um, that just, I guess I'm, I'm asking maybe for them to provide more information in response to their, um, how they're treating sound attenuation versus just asking them to consider it. I think that doesn't imply to me that they have to bring something to us as to what they considered and how it worked. I, that's the only, that's the only thing I want to make sure that we actually get something from them that says this is how it's intended to work, whether it's meeting the wash shot standard or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So minor change. Um, may not be necessary, but the goal is, I want them to actually kind of bring us info. We have something kind of like that related to um, uh, pervious pavement and the um, Southern Gateway design standard. So I'll take a look at that language. It kind of says, you know, if it's not gonna work, you know, demonstrate or something like that. So we'll see if we can come up with something that kind of, you know, ad addresses your concern, but uh, still keeps it, uh, you know, not, not making it so that, as worded, they were basically saying you need to do a study before and a study after, and if it didn't work, <laughs> you know, what do you do now? <laughs> right. Thank you. Council Member Lebo, and then Council Member Bodie. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up on a couple things. Um, one about the sound attenuation. I mean, this is really going to mostly affect our state highways, uh, 104 and, and 522. And it would seem reasonable to reference uh, wash dot standards with regard to things like sound attenuation, where we don't have to recreate the wheel. I agree with council member Riddle that consideration is, is um, merely a road, a uh, speed bump in the, <coughs> in what would be rather a rather speedy process. Um, the other is that um, having timber lagging walls uh, should not be an exterior appearance, in in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's that's clear. If you read through the whole design guidelines, you have to have an appearance that is like these these examples. I, I think that's why examples are really important in design guidelines, photographic examples. Okay. Thank you, Council yeah. Member Bodie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just would echo uh, the comments from Council Members Riddle and Lebo. I completely agree that. We need to have something that says um, it has to be addressed, and if not adopt it, um, uh, then you know uh, explained why not. And uh, I also support Council Member Lebo's uh, concept of uh, referencing the wash dot standard. So something that uh, that that includes both elements that both of my colleagues have mentioned um, would make sense to me. Okay, thank you, De Deputy Mayor Branch, and then uh, in the issue of brevity, I'll just say ditto. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Fertani. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and 
and thank you, Director Bennett, for a good summary of the changes. Um, I just have one dumb comment about basically phrasing. It's in the C3 of the uh, proposed uh, changes. Um, it's the one that starts off in architectural finish, et cetera. Um, it's just the that phrase, namely Pacific West, nor Northwest, seems weird there. So can it be incorporated like supports the Northwest uh, Pacific Northwest community identity of the city showing a strong relationship? It just breaks up that sentence really awkwardly in my view. Okay, yeah, we could okay. do a little grammar smithing on that. Right, so there's no ambiguity, yeah. No. Okay, okay great, Council Member Goldman. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I think the language is pretty good. I agree with the comments about the, the noise. I just have a process question. Um, has the has draft language been sent to the state and have they given their blessing so that we are allowed to have a public hearing or are we still waiting on, on state approval? I think we have, um, we've re requested expedited review and I think uh, uh, the fallback, if for some reason we don't have their, um, their uh, sign off that they have no comments, by the 11th, we can amend the ordinance to say take effect uh, after they've commented. Uh, so, so um, yeah, they they we we was, I was debating whether we should go ahead with something that might still change uh, a fair amount, but decided to go ahead and get it started. So, you know, it, it's at some risk, but I, I think uh, usually um, you know they 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 don't have a lot of comments about this kind of thing. So. So yeah, we we can if work around it if we don't get our comments before the 11th. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? Uh, seeing none, so I think we all agree. Let Steve move on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So the no objection to having public hearing on the 11th. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. 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 Okay. Um, resolution 23, 1893, pledging the city support to the Re zero waste program with King County. Our newest staff, our newest staff member, <laughs> Philippa Cassover. Welcome. <laughs> She's our garbage czar, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Council, you did receive a um, presentation on the King County's Department of Natural Resources Solid Waste Division Zero Waste Goal um, a few weeks back uh, in February. Um, and so this is a, a pledge that doesn't really, that, that really is a, a statement of intent as opposed to any kind of specific action that we would take other than to make sure that our um, garbage uh, vendor does the right things and picks up, you know, recycling and everything. So, um, what, what I'd like for you all to do is to take another look at the pledge, make sure that you're comfortable with it, and um, let me know if there you have any issues, um, because we would really like to get this pl uh, passed in the next, I think in the next meeting. Um, action at the next meeting. Yeah, action at the next meeting on April 27th. Uh, a number of our neighboring cities have already passed this. And um, I'll be glad to take any questions that you have today. Sure. Don't say any questions. So we'll look at the pledge and let us know by next time. Um, with that, I'd have to say you're the best staff member I've ever had. That was the fastest presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, Councilman the Goldman. Um, I'm thinking, I mean, this seems to be very non-controversial. It's in alignment with, you know, having our a climate action committee. Uh, we have a green fair coming up at towards the end of the month. So might we want to take action on it tonight in advance of the green fair? Well, the next meeting before the green fair so too. Is it, but yeah. well, what's the exact date of the green fair? 29. Okay, um, but I mean, I guess the question still stands. I mean, would we want to just take action on it since this seems to be very non-controversial in alignment with our our views? Up to you, council. I'd support it. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. So, um... Maybe you'd like to make the motion to suspend the. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I move that we suspend our three touch rule uh, regarding resolution 23 1893. Second. Our three touch rule has been. <laughs> Are we looking to. Jeez. Suspend the three touch rule for resolution 23 1893. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? 
passed unanimously. Thank you. Anybody like to move resolution 23-293? Well, the risk of, of you know, switching roles here. I, I'll go ahead and move resolution 23-1823. Uh, 1893. Pledging support for the 1893, sorry, pledging support for the Replus Zero Waste Program with King County. Second. Okay, it's moving second. Yes. So, since uh, I have a quick question for you, oh, then, okay. <laughs> um, it really is there any way that the um, this program, you know, it's it's got a lot of really admirable goals. So I'm very much in favor of it. Is there any way to get Lake Forest Park's particular savings slash contribution? The, out of the data they're going to be collecting out of this? Yes. Um, in fact, that data is already available because there are um, there are records kept of every load that goes to the landfill and also every load that goes to recycling and compost. So we already know and we, uh, I get to see some of that data uh, only about once a year, I think. And Lake Forest Park does very well, uh, particularly with compost um, and also with recycling compared to other cities. Uh, you know, there are, there are other cities in the region that don't have compost and recycle pickup so at the curb. So this, is, this, this pledge is really about trying to get all the cities onto the same page to be doing as good a job as we already do here. So th this really, we are a model city <laughs> already. So. Amazing, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, ordinance uh, 23, 1893 has been moved in a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, pass it unanimously. Uh, Matt, you're back up front, ordinance 23. Or you can just sit there and talk to us. <laughs> Do you guys need them in front of you? Oh, ordinance 23, 1265, amending chapter 2.22, volunteer commission system of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code to allow alternates on boards and commissions. Um, in your packet is it an updated ordinance. Um, we, after the last meeting, we rethought the way to do it and we added ended up adding a new section to the uh, volunteer commission system uh, new section 2.22.075 so this will cover basically all the boards and commissions so here for any questions Well, this is the first nobody's speaking. Yeah, I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> um, yes, Councilmember Goldman, please. Um, yeah, I guess we can't have total silence. Um, I, I like the changes. I think it makes it more succinct and, and simple. In this case, I think adds clarity. Um, I, I appreciate section B where you kind of have a policy for what happens if someone unexpectedly leaves a commission, you know, how the alternate system will work with that regard. So um, yeah, I, I like these changes. Thank you. So, anybody? Is this, is this what action time? No, well, it's up to us. You can, we can just do it next time. That's fine. Do that. We'll just, let it yes. marinate. We'll let it marinate. Let for it marinate. Okay, sounds good. Yes, Council Member Uh Just a quick question. Does this uh, also affect the Civil Service Commission? Yeah, yes, we could yeah. technically, um, but there is no requirement to, to put alternates on there. Yes, uh, unless, uh, of course, Mr. Mayor, there are people that you were trying to get on as alternates. Uh, no, we can wait a week. Okay. I really appreciate, though, because this will be really effective in the future, right. keeping things moving. So thank you, Matt. We'll take care of next week. Two weeks from then. Okay. With that, we'll move on to council discussion and action. No. Okay. I'm not going to wait around. Seeing none, how about council committee reports? Committee? I don't think so. Okay. Yes. Uh, we're moving on to council member reports. Yes. Uh, just briefly. Uh, Sound Cities Association picked last night. Very robust discussion. By the way, it's the first time 
in over three years that it was hybrid as a and they actually had about a little less than half at Renton City Hall. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it appears, well, depending on which, which side of that issue you're on, um, they're going to go return to, to the virtual format again the next time because of some challenges and uh, because they were hoping to get about two thirds of the members in person. Having said that, there was an update, a legislative update from Candace Bach. I already, from AWC, uh, she gave an outstanding presentation as I was lamenting to uh, Councilmember Goldman. I wish they recorded those uh, Sound Cities Association meetings, but as policy, they do not. So um, just briefly, you heard me talk about some of the police bills. One of the things that is important is uh, to note, as you're probably aware of this, is the TOD bill has finally, uh, it finally died a day and a half ago. Um, House Bill 1110 is going back for concurrence uh, from the Senate, and as of now, it will require cities under 25,000 uh, a population to have basically duplexes on residential lots. There's some other permutations. We'll see how it uh, ends up in terms of when it comes back from concurrence. Um, a couple other really, really quick things is that there are now, of course, in this, there's only 10 days left in the session, and they are now in a place where everything has to be on an NID basis, need to implement the budget, and so some things are still in the mix. One of the things that is interesting that I did not know is that the McCleary decision has resor will resort back, I believe, if it hasn't already, they will be, the legislature will not be able to do the statutory allowed increases to, um, in terms of property taxes, it'll have to go back to the maximum 1% cap unless they reconcile what many cities have been asking to increase property, the property tax increase cap to two or 3%. Uh, and so it's interesting, the legislature itself is gonna be subject to that same constraint in that regard. Um, and then there's a couple other things that um, we'll be changing here over a period of time. And I think it's important to recognize that um, it's going to happen. Some of these things are going to happen very, very quickly. And so um, we'll see what happens. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that is. Oh, the there was also a presentation on the Veterans um, Health and Human Services Levy Renewal. Um, there was concerns about increases in that regard. Um, and it as it stands right now, what they've been proposing is going to be $17 more per year for the average home. Uh, and it will again, again, this is a renewal, but as it's written, it will provide $565 million over six years for services spread across um, three main tranches and one, one additional tranche as well. So um, there's another thing that they've touched on briefly, which I need to dig into. The apparently something went into effect that kind of flew under the radar that there is a requirement that went that was passed a while ago for uh, apprenticeships on contracts that are over two million dollars. Um, so I'll find out an update on that and get some more information on it. But I just wanted to bring it up here in case anybody knew more far more, more than I do because they just briefly mentioned it. Um, and I know that Sound Cities is going to bring bring that back as a topic to help people understand what the implementation will look like as apparently some of the larger cities have started to do that. That's all I have. Councilmember Bodie, you, I'm sure you have some. Yes, Deputy Mayor, I, I was not on the call, but I do have a question for you because um, I was looking at 1110 and uh, remember that we were originally not going to be considered same as a small city because we were uh, contiguous to Seattle. Uh, and so we were going to have to have the higher densities for Seattle. So um, is that gone? Are you saying that we're we're now a small city? You know, uh, that's an excellent question. They did not touch on that, but I did hear prior to the meeting that the Senate version that has going, gone back to concurrence um, was definitively, um, uh, they listened, the Senate listened carefully to the concerns of the cities. So I'm going to assume that's gone. Does anybody else have any specific knowledge of that, Larry? Um, yeah, the bill itself, um, For it just says for cities less than 25,000 people that are contiguous. 
So there is no sort of separate, like, like we're just a small city. We're a not really boundary. Question. Yeah. So for us, yeah. it is just duplexes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Thank you. I read the bill and I couldn't actually figure it out. So <laughs> Excellent question. Thank I appreciate you. the fact that it wasn't flagged and that council member Goldman seems to be pretty confident. So thank you. Councilmember Cassover. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I will be as quick as I can. So I've attended a couple of important meetings since we last met. First was the Growth Management Policy Board. The thing that's most of interest, I think, to our city is the, the, um, the assistance and guidance that they are providing for comp plan updates, and we will have one due in 2024, which has to be then certified by PSRC in 2025. So the PRCC has tools and manuals. They, um, there is a, uh, on May 18th, there's going to be a presentation for elected officials so that we can understand what it is that our role will be in this whole new um, comp plan update. And they are meeting one-on-one -on -one with city planners. I don't know whether that's happened here in Lake Forest Park yet. Um, so uh, one of the things that's been a bit of an unknown is whether some of the bills before the legislature that um, addressed climate uh, as part of the Growth Management Act would go through. I'm not sure that they have gone through, but they might next time. So anyway, the, the PSRC says that they believe that if we follow their Vision 2050 climate guidance, that will allow us to stay ahead of the curve so that if indeed the legislature does pass new climate regulations for um, the comp plan that we will sort of be in compliance and won't have to worry about it. The other meeting that I attended and Larry, uh, got, Councilmember Goldman was there and so was um, uh, our public works director. Um, was very interesting. We had, we got to meet the new uh, director of the Seattle Department of Transportation. He, came, he recently came here from Los Angeles, I think at the end of last year. And what he's really been focused on is the, the whole concept of Vision Zero, which is reducing traffic uh, fatalities and serious accidents. And so um, the key takeaways, uh, and, and so he, he asked his department to do a top to bottom review of their, um, all of their policies regarding this. And the key takeaways are that safety must be prioritized in design and planning. The, the community and the department must be willing to accept some inconvenience in order to, to gain safety. Um, there needs to be an equity uh, analysis of automated enforce, enforcements, these new authorities that are granted by the state. And there's some good research that shows that, in fact, automated speeding, uh, you know, other traffic ticket enforcements is, in fact, more equitable than officer um, uh, involved ones. Um, and that um, that he's really focused, too, on changing the culture of his department so that safety comes first. And so uh, one of the things that that he one of the questions he was asked was about the concept of level of service on roadways. And um, he said that that's not anything they're going to use anymore, that that, that really is uh, going to come lo much lower down the list for them. Um, safety is where it's at, and that's because of what you know they've experienced. And on point, can you go back? Did he they he say that cameras are more effective than actually having an officer look at you and tell you to stop speeding? No, no, that when it comes to equity, like especially mm -hmm. racial equity, that it's the, the use of cameras reduces the inequity of who's getting the tickets. If you're speeding, you're speeding. I don't care that's who right. you are. That's no, right. That's just... But officers will sometimes stop certain kinds of cars or certain kinds of drivers and let other drivers go, whereas the camera catches everybody. That's okay. the, that's the deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are some things that they're going to do already, and this is good information for us. They're going to phase in more no turn on red uh, lights at intersections. They're going to accelerate the use of leading pedestrian interval um, lights so that yeah. pedestrians get some time before the traffic starts going. Um, 
and that they are partnering with Sound Transit, particularly along Martin Luther King Way, where the light rail and the cars and the pedestrians yeah. all come into conflict there. Um, and they are going to elevate, they're going to change the name of the city traffic engineer, who will no longer be called the city traffic engineer, but will become the chief safety officer for the Department of Transportation. So it's a really a very, you know, quite what robust change, I would say, in the Seattle Department of Transportation. So all very interesting. Then we had a presentation from Shoreline. And Larry, um, please fill me in if I, because I don't think I got everything from Shoreline. Um, their Shoreline Transportation Master Plan. Safety is also their first priority. Equity is very important to them. Yes. They're using a complete streets approach. And they also are accepting a higher level of congestion around, particularly on the transit corridors. Um, they're still going to use level of service for traffic throughput. So they haven't gone quite as far as Seattle on this. Um, it's interesting. They're studying the use of mobility hubs throughout their city, which would be places where transit and rental vehicles and um, other uh, kinds of, you know, you know, not cars, but scooters and electric bikes and things like that are all sort of available in one place. Um, they're also working very hard on a bike uh, route plan. They're trying to keep bikes off of major traffic routes and put them on the secondary, you know, parallel streets. Um, they also have a sidewalk prioritization plan, which a citizen advisory committee has been meeting for 18 months to help them create. Um, and they've done that prior to a ballot that they're, they're going to put out a ballot measure on that. They're also using layers so that they're layering on the, you know, the level of service and the bike paths and the, you know, all these various measures that they use. And they're creating um, points that will help them identify priority projects so that there'll be points assigned for multimodality, um, for equity, for proximity to schools and parks. And they're they're using um, like a table with points on it to figure out which project should go first. Um, and then they're also going to use performance measures post-project to determine what the benefits really have been. So anyway, for any of us who are interested in uh, the whole issue of transportation and traffic, I think taking a look at their plan is good. And also, uh, in fact, I think I, I think we have links to both their plans, don't we, Larry? We can send out. Yeah. Uh, did I miss anything big? And I, sorry, I should have let you do half of that. It's a lot. <laughs> um, no, I think you, you covered it. Uh, I left that, you know, the seashore meeting is 730 in the morning on a Friday. But despite that, I, I left the meeting feeling really excited about both what Seattle and Shoreline are doing. I think these are things as we have our discussion uh, on, on just safe streets. I think it's something that we can look at and you know, how we can integrate it here. So I, I was inspired. Cool. Are you, are you done then? Or I am done. I, um, Council Member Goldman and Council, Council Member Peritani. Um, so also an update on legislation, um, HB 1181, that's the bill that would add climate change to our comprehensive planning. It did pass the legislature. Um, it just awaits Governor Inslee's signature. Um, I think there might be a question as to, since our plan is due in 2024, do we have, is that our final deadline or is there, uh, but that's nuance. The bill itself has passed the legislature. Uh, other update, tree board met last week. Uh, the main, uh, one of the main things we talked about there was the, um, um, the sort of tree planting plans. And we kind of addressed that at our work session earlier. Um, they're very interested in taking part in trying to come up with areas where trees could be planted, either public or private property, and, and just seeing like, what neighborhoods could benefit. Um, the other thing, just I believe we all got an invite this Saturday, uh, two days from now at one o'clock at Horizon View Park, there will be a tree planting ceremony uh, to celebrate Arbor Day, because in Washington, Arbor Day is two weeks before the National Arbor Day. Um, so I think that's uh, updates for me. That's my very time. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yeah, just uh, I didn't want to steal Deputy French's uh, Deputy Mayor French's thunder, but uh, uh, we actually met with um, Alan Curley, who's the uh, Lake Forest Park Water District Manager, and I think this is a really opportune time to start thinking about the McKinnon Creek Trail again. 
and I know that uh, um, there's been some uh, demand in the community for connectivity between neighborhoods. This would be a really a really nice feather in our cap. So we'll keep working on that project. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Um, not much from the mayor. It's been a real. The staff's working real hard. I mean, Sound Transit, the police department, as you heard from police department, it's never slow around here. Just remember, uh, be very thankful for the people we do have working for us. We're very fortunate. Um, we have a couple of people not here tonight. We are missing, and one of them is Phil, so we don't have to listen to him, which makes it easier. <laughs> but Chief, thank you very much. And I know uh, Jeff is, uh, I will tell you guys, that is probably the most loyal employee we have because he actually works Saturdays and Sundays too, believe it or not. He's here all the time. So thank you. I shouldn't let him know that because he'll come visit you, but <laughs> thanks, buddy. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. A great job. Anything else good for the city? Okay, let's go home. Have a good night. Drive safe. Good night, everyone. <laughs> good night, Lori. Take care of yourself. Yes. Yeah. What are you going to redo your whole life? <laughs>